Welcome, everybody, to the Soul of the Unexplained. We are kicking off episode number 18 today, and we have got us one heck of a fun, some would say controversial, and in some instances, maybe even outright terrifying topic that we're going to be talking about today. And we have a great panel of experts uh, that are going to be joining us today. We're going to have a great conversation. And before we get started here, of course, I have to give a big, big welcome to my super awesome co-host and co-creator of The Soul of the Unexplained, Mr. Rogelio Stokes, who, might I add, folks, was just recently married. So, Roger, congratulations, <laughs> man. So good to not only have you here, but, you know, congratulations on your, uh, your, your marriage. That's awesome stuff, man. How you doing? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Super excited to have you here. Yes, I was uh, married last week, so uh, mm. eight days in, everything's great, mm. can't complain, um, super exciting times again, And uh, but yeah, we have got an excellent show tonight um, with some very special guests who will get to the introductions here, but again, for all of our listeners and followers, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we are talking about a very, very fascinating subject on shadow beings and everything related to that, so Jim, I'll hand it back over to you to introduce our guests. Fantastic. Well, as Roger said, folks, today we are finally giving you the episode that we have been promising for the longest time, where we're going to be talking about shadow beings, shadow people, uh, interdimensional beings, the elusive and legendary men in black, and uh, just all kinds of cool things that kind of dovetail into that overall umbrella, if you will, of shadow beings or shadow people and of course there's not an awful lot of resources that are out there but we do have a couple of resources that we're going to be pulling from and uh, we'll provide all the links in the uh, the section below where you guys can go to actually buy copies of the books that we're going to be referring to today and uh, where you can go to find out uh, some more information from the other resources that we called our information from for this particular episode. Uh, during this episode, we're going to be not only uh, discussing some of the things that are in this absolutely fantastic book, which I got to give a shout out to. This is a book called A Walk in the Shadows, A Complete Guide to Shadow People by author Mike Ricksecker. And I absolutely love this book. This is one <laughs> of the best resources. And uh, I see all of our all of our folks here on the panel tonight have a copy of it. But um I was fortunate last year to have an opportunity to meet Mike Ricksecker at Phenomicon oh, cool. and talk to him at length about uh, the experience that I had and just kind of pick his brain uh, a little bit on what uh, some of the things are that he knows about this uh, enigma of shadow people. And I think Mike would probably be the first person to tell you that he's not, quote unquote, an expert because we still don't really know what these things are. And there's such an elusive, such a uh, such a wide ranging and ethereal kind of topic that it's kind of hard to really call somebody an expert um, unless they've actually had an experience themselves, you know, which uh, in, in my case I have. And so has at least one of our uh, panelists who will be joining us tonight. So with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, segue into some introductions and Roger, I am so excited at this gentleman who is going to be joining us tonight mm -hmm. because I've had the uh, wonderful privilege of being a uh, co-host and a guest on one of the uh, many podcasts that this gentleman, by the name of Seth Bridges, based out of the great state of Texas. And uh, right. Seth, those of you that are big fans of the J Free 906 podcast with our very dear friend, Mr. Jeff Freeman, mm -hmm. got to give a shout out to Jeff and Linda. So Seth is joining us today, and uh, Seth, welcome to the Soul of the Unexplained. Such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Roger. I'm very excited. In May, nice to meet you. I'm very excited to be here. It's uh, like you said, I'm usually on the J Free Nine Hundred Six podcast. I'm one of his co-hosts. Uh, and so shout out to Jeff. He's uh, a big reason why we became friends and got to know each other. Because still have yet to meet in person, but we've done some co-hosting together, talking about. Uh, all sorts of fun topics related to Skinwalker Ranch and beyond. So I'm excited to delve into shadow people because I think after one of the uh, episodes with Jeff that you and I co-hosted, we kind of got talking about 
tonight's topic. So thank you for including me. And like you said, it's hard to call myself an expert, but experiencer for sure. So happy to be here and share that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Seth. And so our next uh, guest that is joining us is a, a face that will be familiar to many of you here on the Soul of the Unexplained as May has uh, been gracious enough to fill in for Roger a number of times when Roger wasn't able to join us. And so May, welcome again to this madhouse, this this crazy thing that <laughs> we call the Soul of the Unexplained. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you, Jim. I mean, I, I love the madhouse. It's, you know, that's that's <laughs> normal for me. Um, and, and, you know, like Seth said, I'm not an expert, but I am an experiencer of other things, not particularly in, in shadow people, but some of the things I did read in the book um, really rung a bell. Um, but I'm an expert in myself. And so I think a lot of it is um, trusting my instincts and believing that what I've experienced is a real thing, not just, you know, my imagination or, you know, you know, a dream or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, I don't know if the folks at home can see this, but I figured that if we're talking about shadow people, I might as well have my Depeche Mode Black Celebration t-shirt. So, you know, as I was telling Roger in the, before we got started recording here, you know, I'm also a Black Sabbath fan. So I was trying to think of something that would, you know, Black tying in. So I'm like, oh, hey, I got a Depeche Mode Black Celebration, which of course, anybody that knows me knows that that's my all time favorite album. But um, yeah, just had to, you know, wear this special for the occasion. Okay, yeah, I'm weird. I'm a dork. I know. Anyhow, <laughs> folks, <laughs> we're really I, and excited. You're, you're rocking the cowboy hat too. That's, I like the black cowboy hat on. That's yeah. right. Gotta gotta have the Stetson. And so, Seth, uh, if I heard Jeff correctly on uh, his podcast yesterday, it sounds like you're going to try to make it to Phenomicon this year. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to try. Try and join them and get to meet some of you guys. Uh, I'm just excited to be in the area. That's always been a big dream to, I love Utah, but I've never been to, the, I guess that Northeastern tip. Right. Uh, yeah. that the, U, the UN to basin is in. Um, I've only been in the Southern part, like going through, you know, the national parks uh, that y'all have there. So I love Utah. I would love to go back uh, with my family. So I'm excited to, to see what happens with Phenomicon this year. Are you guys going to be there, right? Oh, yes. ab absolutely. Roger and I, I mean, Seth, you got to have tacos with us, man. That's, <laughs> that's like a rite of passage for people that uh, come to Phenomicon that, that know either me or Roger, you know, we gotta, we gotta sit down we gotta have us some carne asada, some carnitas and you know, all that, all that great stuff. So man, we would love. You know, I'm down for tacos. <laughs> yeah. Right it's amazing. On. You'll love it. You'll love it. The, uh, the Northeastern part there, uh, very similar vibe to the, you know, the south of Utah. So mm -hmm. you get that vibe, but you know, when you come in and having being an experiencer yourself, right, you just get into, you went to County and it just has its own feel. It's amazing. I think you'll absolutely love it. And I uh, look forward to meeting you there. Yep. Cool. And it's, and like Roger says, the moment you get into that, you went to Basin, you are going to feel an energy unlike anything you've ever felt. You won't, it's kind of hard to describe until you actually experience it, but mm -hmm. even well beyond the area where, where Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch is located, that whole yeah. basin just has a, like an electricity, right, Raj? It's just, it's, it's just, yeah. they're, they're, it's unlike anything else. And so that's why it's, it's not difficult to understand why there's all these uh, sightings that, that happen, you know, well beyond the boundaries of Skinwalker Ranch. And it, it's uh yeah it's just a real special place kind of well, i don't know yeah, if you've ever been to sedona but it's 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 not too different from that yeah and, and when you look at the petroglyphs in the area like some of the most unique petroglyphs so obviously you know it's it's this energy and sightings uh, like they say on the show all the time it's not just the ranch it's the whole basin that's yeah. right absolutely all righty well let's dive in folks and let's uh let's, let's talk it. about these crazy things that are known as shadow beings or shadow people. So to start off, I figure uh, why not ask the question, what are shadow beings? And a great way for us to, uh, to approach that is to read a little segment from this uh, A Walk in the Shadows book by author Mike Ricksecker. And this is taken from the, uh, the introduction of the book on page 19. And he says, 
What are shadow people? That's the biggest question surrounding these mysterious entities, and we still don't have very many clear answers. Are they aliens? Are they time travelers? Are they just dark colored ghosts? Perhaps they are none of these, or perhaps they are even all. So what are mm. what are some of your thoughts on that, guys? What do you what do you what do you think? What uh, when when somebody says shadow being, what's one of the things that, that your mind just kind of gravitates towards? Ooh, I, I'm kind of in the all camp, uh, but uh, I, 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 and something here and not here. It's hard. It's it is so hard to fit a <laughs> to point a, put a put a finger on and say that's what it is. Right. Um, so I struggle to answer that question. I I think um, we all do. If we're if we're being perfectly honest, I mean it's. And we're going to we're going to get into this in just a minute where we're going to talk about um, Mike Ricksecker lays out kind of like the, the five most common types of shadow being or entity that people report when they have one of these instances. But um, May, when somebody talks about a shadow being or a shadow figure, what's what's one of the things that comes to your mind on that? Honestly, the biggest thing or, or the majority of them, I feel, are interdimensional observers to me is, mm. is the feeling that I get. Um, when you go a little bit further and you you think about the ones that have kind of a malicious feeling to them, um, well, I mean, at least three of us here uh, have adhered to the same faith that tell us that there is more walking this earth than what we really see. And that there are these, if you believe in God, you have to believe in Satan and evil too. And there are these third of the host of heaven whose only job is to lead us astray. And so I feel that sometimes when we're looking at malicious entities, that this could be that manifestation. Um, and so it comes down to who's imitating who? Are they imitating the shadow beings, the interdimensional beings that people have experienced um, to kind of try to slip in there, you know, and, and yeah, we're one of these guys. Um, it, it kind of makes me feel like there, there's that imitation possibility, mm. uh, especially when you are able to actually feel a, a different vibe coming from them. Right. And I know a lot of people, you know, think that's a pretty far out kind of thought, but to me, having grown up with that uh, knowledge that with that faith, it just makes sense to me. Right. Well, let's, uh, you, you bring up a, a, a good point there and that is, and, and I guess we should, we should emphasize this before we go any further for all of our viewers out there, particularly the viewers out there that maybe don't have a particular uh, spiritual belief or belong to any particular denomination the reality is we don't know what any of these things are. They are a mystery. Uh, and furthermore, because of the nature of them, and I would say much more different than, say, the UFO or the UAP phenomenon, where multiple people can witness them at the same time, these, uh, these sightings of shadow beings tend to be very specific to one individual. They're very transient, if you will. They're not something that happens on a you know constant daily basis and even when they occur now there's there's a lot of film clips that are out there that show uh some very what i would call compelling evidence at least anecdotal evidence of what look to be these shadows moving across you know a room mm -hmm. or uh you know there's there's even some that that mike ricksecker himself uh, I believe his team have captured on on film that, um, but the general gist of it, and for both the experience that uh, Seth and I had, which we're going to talk about uh, here shortly, these things are are by nature isolated events, and you generally, when you're experiencing them, especially when when it came to to my experience, and and I think with Seth as well is you don't have a means of quote unquote recording the event via, you know, say, Oh, I'm going to grab a, my cell phone because in my instance, I was absolutely 
terrified. I mean, like literally frozen, paralyzed with fear, you whatever you want to call it. And so because of that, and because we don't really know a whole lot about what these things are, uh, where they come from, why they're here, because of those things, again, there is no real quote unquote expert in the field. There are merely people who believe or have faith that such things are possible and can exist. And then there are people that, again, they cross that threshold where they go from having the faith that there's a possibility that they can exist to being an experiencer and having firsthand knowledge because they saw it, they felt it, they know about it, and they know that these things are real. And that's how it is for me anyway. I know that these things are real because they happened to me. Now, prior to this, I had never had any, you know, kind of like Dragon talks about on the on the Secret of Skinwalker Ranch TV show. He likes to call himself Paranormal Kryptonite. I was like that, and Roger can kind of attest to that. You know, whereas like everything happens to Roger, <laughs> nothing happens to me. I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. <clears throat> Although my wife would tend to probably disagree with that every time I take my shirt off, you know, <laughs> probably looks like a Sasquatch. But um, that that fact notwithstanding, I never really had anything truly extraordinary, particularly of this nature, an encounter with a shadow being uh, prior to my own experience. And so once I had that experience, I became somebody who had that knowledge. I knew because I saw it. I knew it because I experienced it. And um, I think it will, we'll find out in learning from Seth, I would imagine Seth probably feels the same way that it's not just something that he believes, you know, might be possible. He, he actually saw something. And um, we, so, so again, folks, as we, as we go into this, those of you that are not believers in anything spiritual that don't, you know, whether you're atheist or agnostic, again, Keep an open mind because we're going to tell you right up front. We don't know. We don't have the answers. And anybody that tells you that they do, well, good for them. You know, have fun storming the <laughs> castle, right? <laughs> but uh, bye bye. Yeah, right. So we're just having we're just having an open discussion, folks, and we're going to be offering our own viewpoints. And of course, as always, you're welcome to agree or disagree. So. Having said that, in my typical overly verbose manner, <laughs> Roger, what are what are what are your thoughts when somebody says shadow being or shadow person? What uh, what comes to mind for you? Immediately, what comes to mind for me is when I was little and just seeing, for example, I remember junior high. I'd get home from um, you know get home from school, take the bus. My parents were at work. My brothers and sisters were elsewhere. So I'd go into the house and uh, when I was going downstairs to my room, you know, it's the end of the day. Kind of, you know, I remember specifically my room and my, and my downstairs basement in the house growing up. But I'd go in there and I would just see just flecks of black just going by me. And I'd turn and look, mm. nothing there, right? And then as I'd walk along, I would just see more and more. And, you know, having, the, I, I guess, thinking about those that's what I think of like when I think about shadow people right just something that is just kind of at that corner of your vision you feel something but you don't necessarily like see it up front which is different of course because I, I know that uh within this book a walk of shadows uh, Mike talks about different types of shadow beings um and so just a couple of my experiences where I don't necessarily think I've seen like a full-on shadow person but I have felt the presence of something that I cannot explain. And right when I turn to look at it, there's nothing there. But as I continue on my path, right, I see things that, you know, uh, whether it's I'm watching like a, a documentary or talking with other people, but people have had similar experiences where things have like just off that corner, right? Just I don't know how to explain it, but just that peripheral vision where you see something move and you just have a feeling and you look, but it's not there. And I kind of wanted to, to throw something out here and, and just get your, all of your ideas on it. So I've, with some of the paranormal experiences I've had, and I, I, with this discussion, thinking about shadow people, I'm wondering if this is almost a type of shadow 
type entity or ghost type entity that I don't know, but I've discussed this before with you, Jim, but in various places that I've lived with, um, with my oldest son, um, and I think that he's home and he's not, I will get a knock on my door. It'll be typically later at night and I'll see like the shadow of what I think to be him. Like there's somebody like just underneath that door, right? When there's just the light there and somebody's there. And so I'll be like, Tyler, Tyler, no answer. I'll open the door. Nobody's there. I go check his room. He's not home. Give him a call. Like, yeah, no, I've been out all day. So I'll go back, you know, shut my door, continue to work on my stuff that I'm doing. And then it'll happen again. So not only am I getting a physical man manifestation of hearing like something knock, but I do see some type of shadow out there. Like something is physically standing there. Yet when I open the door, it's silent. There's nothing there. I feel something's there, but I'm just curious what you guys think about that. Because before I'm thinking like, yeah, that could be a potential like paranormal ghost type experience, but I also feel it could, I guess, cross over into the realm of like shadow beings. Sounds so like, to... yeah, I, I, well, I love everything y'all said. Everything I, my answer was awful. Cause it was, it, I, all my thoughts were like, just to me. And so I was trying to say like, how do I express something so personal? But I loved everything you said, May, with like spiritual observer and, and, you know, Jim, like you, you say robust, but everything you say was dead on. And Roger, your experience, I, as a kid, I didn't put it together until reading this book. I had a, one of the crawlers knock on my door open the door come in the room uh and and then i went didn't see anybody but uh i sounds like you seen the shadows to me i would i'm ringing bells like i felt got like the oh. you know uh may you said trust your instincts like my instincts are telling me like roger trust your instincts that was shadow interdimensional maybe manifesting as a shadow i don't know what type of shadow being but um yeah, just like in the book and with my experience uh, as a kid, uh, they, you know, the opening and closing doors seems very easy for them. Even touching us uh, is pretty possible and, uh, and regular. I was, I was really surprised by the book. Sorry, I'm jumping around. I was really surprised by the book, by how many experiencers had had that physical intera interaction or actually had a seen them manifest enough to open and close a door. Um, yeah. So sorry, I got all excited, but yeah, no, I think it's amazing. No, I, no, we, 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 I, we love that excitement, Seth. And that's, <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I'm so happy to have you on here. It's um, if I'm being perfectly honest, that's one of the things that absolutely really shook me to my core in reading this book that, that Mike has these accounts, particularly his own personal account of when I think he was like eight or nine years old, his very first shadow being encounter where he's this little kid and he's lying in bed and all of a sudden, this this tall shadow entity appears, materializes in his room, and it's just standing over him, watching him, and he can tell that it doesn't have any facial features. And then this thing reaches down, and this this shadow being it, it grabs his wrists and puts his wrists up, you know, against his shoulders like this, as though he were, you know, a a a, a corpse being you know posed in a casket kind of type thing, and back in the old days when they used to, you know, stand caskets, you know, kind of straight up and put the body in there and, you know, they, they'd have the arms up like that. And so this thing actually was able to physically touch and move uh, young Mike Ricksecker's limbs. And the, the, the reason why that creeped me out is, and, and Roger and May can attest to this, my particular faith which is the Latter-day Saint faith, just so full disclosure, so all of you know that. We are Christians, and we we don't we we tend to believe that if there if you're dealing with a a a disembodied spirit or quote unquote a demon where mm -hmm. you're dealing with an entity that has never had a physical body, they're not supposed to be able to do things like this. They're not supposed to be able to touch you. And so that was where I really kind of was like, oh, oh my gosh, what are we dealing with here? Because my, you know, I, I, as Roger did, I served as a missionary for my church for two years. And so I know the ins and outs of my religion really well. And my religion, my beliefs didn't have an answer for that. And they still don't. And that's part of the reason why I am having difficulty reconciling. And it's not because, as, as you'll hear in, in my account here in just a bit, 
the shadow being that I encountered did not make any kind of physical contact with me in any way. It was starting to, it was trying to, and that's when everything kind of went off the rails for, for my experience. But um, reading these accounts where these shadow beings are actually able to, like you said, Seth, materialize to the point to where they can uh, physically affect their environment in, in regards to opening doors or moving a curtain or, you know, actually touching somebody like happened with Mike Ricksecker when he was a child. Um, that's not an insignificant thing. Am I, am I wrong here? Any, anybody want to offer a thought on that? No, you're not wrong at all. It's, uh, it, it, it is hard to, like you said, it, it's, <laughs> it's hard to find an answer in anybody's religion or anywhere it's it's uh, i don't the funny thing for me is like you were saying you know so a lot of people that experience this start off maybe they believe it's possible maybe they don't i was in the totally i was agnostic about god i was atheist about ghosts demons mm -hmm. a, aliens as a kid i liked all that i was very spiritual uh, religious as a kid but as an adult at the time of my shadow person experience, I was like, none of this is real. Maybe there's a God, nobody knows. And then shadow uh, hat man, uh, ironically led me to where now I would say I'm a Christian without uh, a church. You know, I don't know. I grew up Episcopalian and then Baptist now. I don't know. Uh, I don't know, but I know that I, uh, I saw I, through doing some personal meditation and stuff because my, shadow man experience shook me to my core because i i didn't know like you said i didn't know how to explain it and nothing that i believed fit into that so i had to try and go and find a cosmic consciousness view that could fit that and i sought it in meditation breath work and then all of a sudden jesus in one of my breath work sessions like a golden jesus in my mind and it's kind of like that was weird i wasn't seeking jesus at all and um now i'm back to you know where i would you know proudly say yeah i'm a christian jesus is my my, you know, my lord and savior but uh what yeah. church i belong to i don't know you know that's yeah. i'm not in a rush to find one but i'd like to but uh it, yeah like you said it's <laughs> am i gonna find a church that will explain to me what shadow people are no i, I think we just have to be okay with not knowing <laughs> right. and that's and you that you hit it right on the head seth it's okay to admit when we don't know something and sometimes that is the hardest thing to say is to say you know with all of my religious upbringing you know all the years of sunday school and seminary um i don't know i can't explain this thing and in talking to many of my other fellow latter-day saints they also are are at a loss and so when it and and just to your your point that you made just kind of just stray a little bit here forgive me but for me, it doesn't matter what religion or what kind of belief system anybody has, because to me, spiritualism and the spiritual aspect is so much more important because I think that's something that we all share as humans, whether you're Christian mm -hmm. or Jewish or Muslim, um, what have you. Uh, and I, I think it comes down to that fact. And May, uh, we talked about that, that energy, that toroidal energy field that that, that Mike kind of talks about in his book um, that you can sense, you know, when people say, Oh, that guy's got a, I get a bad, a bad vibe. He's got, you know, bad juju coming off of that guy. Um, that's a very real thing. That's something that's measurable. Right. And we've mm -hmm. seen instances where you can take a tri-field meter and if people are recounting stories of uh, really uh, intense spiritual experiences or, ghost encounters and you'll actually see that tri-field meter you know move and so th there there there's clearly something measurable that's there within the certain you know frequencies and that right there I, I think is a key word to all of this is frequency and vibration and consciousness i think it's all you know i i don't ask me how it all fits in but i think that all three of those things frequency consciousness and um vibration because obviously frequency ties in with, you know, vibration, but then, mm -hmm. you know, consciousness, your, whether you call it your spirit, your soul, your life force, your energy, your consciousness, I believe that's what makes us who we are. And I think that mm -hmm. that's the thing that 
when we experience physical death, I don't think that's the end. I think that that essence of us, that consciousness, that spirit, that soul, I believe that that lives on. And where does it live on? I think it lives on in another, what we would call a dimension, another mm, space with another space within our, our own space, as it were. Um, but that's, that's just my own personal interpretation on that. But um, I think that's awesome that you were able to, to find something like that, Seth. And, you know, and that's ultimately what it comes down to. You find what works for you, mm -hmm. find whatever brings you that, that peace and that, you know, yeah uh, I, yeah one one quick thing when we were talking to on jeff's podcast we got to talk to the the navajo rangers right and somebody in the audience asked them you know what what um what navajo prayer or something should i do to cleanse my house and uh, the rangers recommended you know well if, unless you're navajo like is it going to work you know seek what your ancestors did and that rang a bell with me. And I think for a long time, I was pushing away Christianity because of my own personal like things I was throwing on it. But honestly, I think wanting to connect to my my grandparents and my ancestors led me back to, to that. And I, I think there is power. I don't, you know, that then death is not the end of our communion with one another. I, I think I can call out to my grandparents and I know I've had stuff happen where I asked my grandmother for help and right away she answered. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> experiencing something like that it can, can really have beautiful, profound effects and, and make, while scary, can make you realize that there's so much more and this isn't the end and we're, we're going, we're going somewhere. I think, I think we're meant to die. I think, uh, I think this new age, uh, no, live forever. I think it's a trap. We're not meant to live forever. What in nature lives forever? Nothing. Around things to do. <laughs> to go um, way off track there. Yeah. So, Roger, I on on your experience, I have a question: Is when you were experiencing that, how did you feel? I mean, what kind of vibe did you get? Were you frightened? Were you just curious? Were you, you know, nonchalant? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, when it first happened, I didn't feel anything. Um, because I think my logical side was making an assumption like my son's home, right? Like I can see his shadow out there. He's knocking on my door. It wasn't until after I called out his name, opened the door, went out, looked in his room, called him, confirmed that it wasn't him. Did I get um, feeling just something wasn't quite right? And I've had that feeling other times in my life where I'm like, okay, I'm either being watched by something that, I never felt that it was like an entity that uh, had a malicious intent, but it was just something that was observant, something neutral and almost wanting to see how I would react to the situation, which is interesting because after that happened, um, like I went back in, of course, closed my door, started going again. And then it happened three more times, each time with more escalation, more force, being knocked on the door and then that's after that third time that's when it kind of got to the to the point where I'm like I am not comfortable with with what's happening in my home and to me and so I couldn't explain what was going on and at that point I told whatever there was that they were to leave not come back but I was also made the decision to leave because the atmosphere was just so uncomfortable. It was really oppressive that I had to get out of there just to kind of regain that positive energy, go out and feel nature and get it out and just like get that. And I went and talked to my son about it. And, you know, we had some good discussions and, um, you know, I came back and everything felt fine. Um, still have those types of paranormal experiences, but I guess it just really depends on, you know, what I'm doing and when, but it typically doesn't escalate that that was one of the worst times I've had where it escalated to a point where I just didn't feel comfortable being in that same area with whatever this was. No, my, my first impression would be that with the way it kept doing this is that it's almost like a playful trickster type thing mm -hmm. that is, it's just messing with you. It is just, yeah. you know, and of course, because you can't, you can't reconcile what it is. Of course, it's making you uncomfortable and then absolutely making it clear, go away. And, and maybe that that's my first impression. If it keeps doing it, it's playing with you. It's messing with you. Um, and then in the case that um, if you had recently had someone close to you pass away, 
that's the other thing that that I then go to because my husband had an experience where he um my aunt had passed away and he could feel there was this presence outside our bedroom door and we had this curtain that only went down so far so he says it felt like when one of the kids is standing outside the door just standing there again that toroidal field and you know there's somebody there and he says i just felt like somebody was there and my aunt amalia had passed away just a few days before and and i said oh it was amalia that that's it hmm. that's and it never happened again but it wasn't as um you know it didn't have any noises knocking and and then just the fact that it can actually create manifest that noise whether it is actually physically knocking because as we said already you know we've been taught that spirits who've never had bodies cannot physically do things but then we also see that in the other types of shadow beings that were talked about where they're ghosts who have not been able to get the energy to manifest it almost seems to me like if you're saying that it got more intense each time as you started to feel nervous, as you started to put out this negative feeling, it seems to me like it was pulling. feeding off of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and one of the things that, and let me just share with you, because um, there was an experience and, and I'm wondering if part of my paranormal experiences, especially with everything that has to do with my son is kind of tied into my relationship with my oldest son. Um, because there's a lot of what I would say to your point, may trickster type stuff that has happened where I think it's my son, but it's not. And it all started when uh, I think it was back in the year 2000. So my son was really little. Uh, we went to um, here in Utah. The theater is no longer there. It's called the Starship Theater. Um, we went to see uh, Toy Story 2, but this theater was broken down. There was like police stuff or police uh, tape. So do not cross. Half the lights were gone. And um, me, my wife and my son were, and he was only like three, four at the time. And we're sitting there waiting for the movie to start. And my son, like I was talking to my wife and then my son said, no, stop that. And I'm like, what's going on, Tyler? But he wasn't looking at myself. He was looking forward and he's like, no, you don't talk away about, you don't talk that way about my dad. You stop it right now. And I'm like, Tyler, who are you talking to? And he's like, that man. And then what he did is he started looking up. And so I followed his gaze and it went up toward the top of the theater. And then over to the right hand corner is your face of theater. And there was just a big black shadow mass there where there weren't any lights. And I said, you're talking to someone up there. And he's like, yeah. And he doesn't like you. Oh, wow. And I said, can you see him? And he's like, mm, yeah, he's still there. And then um, anyway, I got a really horrible feeling from that. So me and my wife, we just got up and we're like, we're going to go find a different movie. Um, there you go. But ever, yeah. Ever since that, there's been, I've had entities around me where that will play tricks, where I hear my son's voice, but he's not there. And so I'm wondering if that's, I, I'm, you know, I'm, not trying to make a correlation like this is specifically, but it seems to me ever since that experience, whatever this being is or series of beings, they like to mimic my son and try to play with that relationship somehow. Wow, that's, wow. that's, that's really interesting. That's really oh. fascinating, Raj. I mean, I, I again, you're, you're like a magnet for these, these kind of experiences. And, and I'm crazy. like, you know, they just, they just, you know, not, not that I'm complaining, mind you, <laughs> not, <laughs> not in the slightest, but uh, man, that's, um, I can't even imagine what that's got to feel like uh, being in your shoes when you experience those things, Roger. I mean, most, most people would probably be, uh, you know, as Pete Kelsey says, their, their socks would be turning brown, <laughs> among other things, you know. Yeah, but, it's just um, cra crazy experiences yeah. that I've had and, uh, you know, things that I like, these topics I really like because it makes me think about all the stuff that I that has happened to me and it just seems more interconnected than I may even realize and yeah uh, and that and that you guys have had similar uh experiences maybe not the exact same experience but they all seem interconnected and you know something's at the heart of it so I really thank you for listening mm -hmm. and providing your your perspective absolutely absolutely so 
I thought what we would do, folks, is let's uh, let's talk about um, Mike Ricksecker in his book, A Walk in the Shadows. Really, uh, he, he breaks down what some of the more common uh, types of shadow figures or shadow people that are seen. And uh, so he, he breaks them down into a really, really easy to understand and concise manner and provides uh, uh, examples of, of each one. So for, for the interest of time, I don't think we'll we'll we'll. Um, We'll talk about these specific examples of uh, some of the stories that he's mentioned, but uh, I thought that we would start off with talking about what uh, those those big uh, five primary types of shadow beings are. So the first one is what he calls a just a simple humanoid figure, and what he means by that is it's a tall human shape, seemingly male, with no discernible features. Everything is black. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, no facial features, no clothing to view. They typically just stand motionless and silent. And that one appears in a significant number of the reports of shadow beings that uh, that are out there. Just these, just these very basic, vague, humanoid-shaped uh, figures. Uh, some people say that they're anywhere from, you know, seven to 10 feet tall uh, by estimate. Um, you know, I've, I, I, I think that one, you know, makes, makes a fair amount of sense to me. The second one that uh, Mike talks about is uh, the one that uh, Seth and I are both going to be talking about in a little bit, because this is the um, manifestation, if you will, of shadow being that both, Seth and I saw, and this is a shadow being that is known quite simply as Hat Man. Mm -hmm. So, what is Hat Man? Giving me goosebumps here, Jim. <laughs> so, feel that energy already. So, Hat Man is the most feared form of shadow being. He is tall. He is sometimes estimated again to be seven to ten feet tall, usually wearing a fedora or a top hat or some other kind of wide-brimmed uh, hat. The appearance will seemingly adopt a particular style or manner of dress representing certain time periods. For instance, the fedora wearing hat man is often seen wearing a long trench coat, whereas the top hat variant is sometimes seen wearing a cape or a tuxedo. Uh, they come with an overt sense of fear or dread and a feeling that it is there to terrorize, menace, or otherwise inflict some kind of harm. It is sometimes accompanied by other shadow beings of humanoid form, not necessarily other shadow beings of wearing hats as well, but just other vague shadow beings sometimes accompany this hat man. And hat man is considered to be like uh, what Mike refers to as an emotional vampire <clears throat> and that it seems to feed and draw power from the fear or negative energy of the experiencer and all that i can tell you folks is that to a t fits what i experienced in my uh hat man manifestation that that uh, i had last year the third is what he calls red-eyed entities and these are devious entities who much like hat man come to menace terrorize or to oppress in some way they have deep red eyes, which contrast alarmingly with the otherwise complete blackness of their other features. And then we got the fourth kind of shadow being, which he calls the hooded figure. And hooded figures are considered menacing in nature, although not as menacing as the hat man being. Worth taking the note that sometimes the hooded figure has also been seen as almost benevolent as opposed to being there to torment or to terrorize. Some people perhaps equate the appearance of the hooded figure shadow being to that of the Grim Reaper and therefore equate it with an impending sense of death and or doom. Although the Grim Reaper itself, if it exists, would not be considered a shadow being because its purpose, if you will, is merely to collect or gather souls of the departed and then lead them to the next realm or dimension or state of existence, what have you. So at least with the hooded figures, there seems to be some indication that there is uh, maybe possibly some benevolent actors among the hooded figure shadow beings. 
which I found to be rather kind of interesting. And then number five is a manifestation that Mike refers to as the wisp. And perhaps the most often seen variety of shadow being, they are tall, narrow, translucent, and very fast moving beings. They look as though someone hit the fast forward button on someone wearing dark clothing. They move incredibly fast and are most often viewed out of the corner of one's eye. See, we talked about that earlier, as opposed to being viewed straight on. <clears throat> now, there is a strong belief that these particular kinds of entities, the, the wisp, are not malicious, but perhaps interdimensional beings that momentarily or brief, briefly materialize into our dimension. And so I thought that was that was kind of interesting. So those are kind of the five primary uh, types of shadow being. And again, we have the humanoid figure, the dreaded hat man, the red-eyed entities, the hooded figure, and the wisp. So uh, those those are the the big five, as it were. And he also gives mention to three other types of shadow beings that, in at least in the last several years, maybe last couple of decades, there's been more reports of these particular kinds of manifestations. And the first one of these kind of newer ones <clears throat> is what is referred to as simply black mist. And so what that is, is an amorphous, cloud-like, almost vaporous or smoke-like manifestation. It has no sound. It appears suddenly and vanishes just as quickly as it, as it appeared. It has no real form at all, although sometimes they are seen to form into very vague shapes or outlines of humanoids or even other objects. And then there is the what he calls the wraith. Now, the wraith is much like the, the wisp shadow entities, and wraiths uh, move very quickly, and some believe them to be more malicious in nature. Uh, quite possibly, they might be the disembodied souls or ghosts, or three, perhaps even uh, demonic entities. And then there is the, uh, the one that Seth actually mentioned uh, at the beginning of our program tonight, is a type of manifestation known as the crawler. And the crawler is considered the creepiest form <laughs> of all the shadow entities. And I've never seen one, but hearing them described, I think I would probably my socks and everything below the waist would probably be brown as well <laughs> if I ever saw one of these things. But they are humanoid in shape. They are exceedingly fast in movement and they crawl about on all fours as is often depicted in horror films about demonic possession. And uh, they are, according to Mike, undeniably sinister in nature. So folks, those uh, there's, there's actually eight, if you will, five primary kinds of shadow being with three other ones that uh, that are also gaining some kind of prominence and frequency in regards to the number of experiences that are being reported by people out there throughout the world. So um, Seth, what are what are some of your thoughts on on those five or those those eight? Do any of them any of them stand out to you other than the obvious? Are, are, yeah, are well, yeah, hat, hat man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Hatman and uh, the crawler. I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, as a kid, real quick, I was reading, turned off my light, was sitting in the dark for a couple of minutes trying to fall asleep. So uh, I hear a knock on my bedroom door, and I'm in middle school, and I have a lot of siblings. So I'm like, who is it? The door opens, and I can see someone crawl in my room and close the door behind them and then crouch on the ground by my door. And they don't say anything. And I'm like, who is it? And I'm like, ha ha, which one of you is it? And I start naming my siblings, you know, who are you? And no answer. And finally I'm like, and I reach over and I turn on my lamp. No one's in the room. I get up, walk through the house. Everybody's asleep. I didn't think about this for years. It just was always one of those weird things wow. that happened to me. Yeah. And it wasn't until reading this book guys. And it's funny, you, you touched about on this earlier, Jim where you're, and, and Roger, where you're like, these things happen and we don't really know to connect them until we start talking about it and reading other people's experiences. When he started talking about the crawler, I was like, oh my goodness, as a kid, I experienced a shadow person. I, and this was before the ring or any of the popularized stuff. And, and I, I wasn't asleep. 
Um, this was not a dream. I have horrible recollection of dreams. <laughs> they, and this has just always been a weird thing. But yeah, the crawler, mine wasn't really fast, but creepy sense of like, ooh, like what is in my room? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, yeah, reading this book definitely put a name to it. And, and overall, with all the different categories, I, I think they're really helpful. And, and I think they're going to help a lot of people like us who've experienced these things. Uh, and what's, I don't know if, what the saying is, you put a name to it, you take its power or, you know, something like yeah. that. I feel like this is doing that. And it's gonna, it's really helpful. And Mike is, uh, I was impressed by, by how he broke that down and appreciative of it as well. Yeah. The way, the way that Mike lays all this stuff out and, you know, the, the thing that I respect the most about Mike is he doesn't speak in, in terms of absolute facts saying this is absolute knowledge. I'm right. And that's the end of the discussion. He is very open about the fact that this is a mystery. These are just all he's doing is he's he's you know gathering up all these accounts and he's looking for patterns of consistency, which is what any really great investigator should do. And again, you know, Seth, you and I, we always talk about the one of the things we love the most about uh, Skinwalker Ranch and the guys that are out there is that they follow that mantra of they go where the data leads them. And yeah. any investigator worth their salt, that's what they should be doing is trying to avoid, you know, okay, I've got my little clearly defined box of what I want this to fit into. So I already have my determination of what this is. So that's where I'm going to go. And that's, that's the danger of all of this, of anything pertaining to the unexplained, whether it's UFOs, UAPs, cryptids, shadow people you name it if you have a preconceived notion you know avoid jumping on the bandwagon you know really try to you know do your research do your homework talk to other people and that sometimes is the hardest thing is breaking that stigma i mean it has been for me i mean i i have struggled with my experience for the last year in fact we're almost one year ago to the day that my experience mm. happened. I mean, that's, you know, my, my hair is already standing up on my forearm. Um, but it's, it's like you say, Seth, it's something that when other people talk about it, you are able to put pieces of the puzzle together or, or at least make them, you know, fit where before it was kind of like this big, huge, massive confusion. And when you're starting to be able to put some names or some terminology to it, it kind of, demystifies it and it makes it for me anyway it makes me feel less less weird you know less crazy and and caleb talked about that roger when we had him on uh he used the word the term validation right when you yeah. find out that somebody else had the same exact kind of experience that you did uh even if it's not you know completely to a t but even more so when it's like that's exactly what i experienced you get that validation and that's where really gathering strength and courage comes from. And that's how you start to destigmatize um, all of this stuff as it pertains to matters that are unexplained. And, and Seth, I loved, I think it was you that, that mentioned it when um, we, when, when we, when we were on Jeff's podcast and we had John Dover and John's uh, partner with the Navajo Rangers. And he specifically said, you know, it doesn't matter if you're if you're Navajo, whatever your culture teaches you to use for protection against, you know, bad energy, bad spirits, mm -hmm. whatever you have, any whatever, whatever term you want to ascribe to it. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, because if you if you really pay attention to Mike's book, he's kind of saying the same thing, because obviously he, he tells about how he came from a Catholic background. So, of course, Catholics, one of the things they carry around is rosary beads, um, crosses. They mm -hmm. have this belief in, in holy water. And it doesn't really matter if you, the viewer, are watching this. And if you're not Catholic and you're saying, oh, well, I don't believe in rosary beads. Or if you're not Christian or if you're, you know, if you're Jewish, whatever the case may be, whatever it is that that you feel will work to help protect you and guide you, that's what you go with. And that's where I get back to that whole umbrella term of spirituality is far more important because we all share that in common. We're mm -hmm. all human beings. We all, there's, there's that, you know, and if you want to break it down into non 
theological terms. There's just that energy that we all have as human beings. And so I, I, I don't think the importance of that can, um, can be said too many too many times it can be overstated no you're you're right you got it you i mean it's there, there's that energy and power that you're tapping into when you're following in the footsteps of your ancestors uh you know i'm proud to, to practice follow the same you know god that my fathers did uh, i think there's power to that and they're with you and like like you said it doesn't matter if i was hindu or jewish or christian it's what you believe like jesus said when he healed people he said by your faith you have been, you know, you've been healed. He didn't say, Hey, I did it. You know, you're welcome. Right. He said by your faith and, uh, you know, thy faith has made of, the whole. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of experiencers, when they'll say like, Oh, this saved me, they'll be like, it was my belief in God that saved me. They didn't say, Oh my right. God saved me. God showed up and saved me. No, their belief, they were able to tap into that. We are not divine, but we are, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're made by it. So we can, access it i'm not articulating it as clearly as i'd like to, no, I, but, I i know exactly uh, what you mean buddy i know exactly what you mean no you're yeah. you're you're hitting the proverbial nail right on the head i think so and, <laughs> and um so uh, may what are as i was reading through that that list of the different kinds of shadow beings did any of those stand out to you in, in particular that uh were of interest or that gave you the willies or anything like that all those crawlers <laughs> definitely give me the willies and seth the fact that this thing closed the door behind it that's even yeah. more sinister um, well at least it was considerate to close the door right you know <laughs> but uh, i um, was telling my wife that story and she reenacted it and it scared me oh so much goodness. it was like i was back in that room oh my gosh that is crazy <laughs> wow um of those the, the one that you didn't mention um and i guess because they haven't really he talked about it not necessarily being a shadow being, but the old hag syndrome was the one that had stood out to me talking about that because of the way that so many cultures have a version of the hag, which is to describe it's this feeling or actually an experience of somebody sitting on your chest and, you know, it this weight on your chest and there's, there's reason in associating it with sleep paralysis. Um, but having experienced the weight on my chest as a child, um, and then also being severe asthmatic, I mean, there's all these different ways to connect this. But reading about that, about the old hag, I thought, oh my gosh, that's that's pretty much what I felt when I was a kid. And it was an experience in which I was about five years old. I was sick, sleeping in my mom's bed, and I was asleep, but I was aware of the room around me. But in this case, there was this track on the ceiling that was lowering uh, bundles of fabric. My mom stored her fabric in these really cool fabric bundles, but this bundle was being lowered from this track onto my chest. And so I, mm. I equate that with the hag and it was on my chest and I could smell um, ozone, burnt electronics. And mm. this was just something that stuck with me. Five years old and right around that time is when I was diagnosed with uh, some pretty severe asthma and just a dream that always stuck with me. Fast forward about 14, 15 years and I've got a pretty bad case of pneumonia, had about a 40% lung uh, capacity working when I was admitted to the hospital. And I'm laying there in my hospital bed and I look up at the ceiling and I see the track from the curtain that goes around the bed. And I feel this weight on my chest of having 40% capacity working. And then in my nose, because I've got the the tubes in my nose, I can smell this very uh -huh. ozone smell. And so reading about that and reading about, you know, the, the, the hag um, and also then considering time slips and, and the different things that he discusses in there. And I thought, wow, I always knew, of course, at 19, I knew I dreamt my own near death because it wasn't until six months later that my doctors told me one more day and you would have been dead. Um, wow. So I'm like, 
was this a warning? Was this a be prepared? Was this a time slip in which I experienced this, you know, 14 years in advance? Um, it, I found that very fascinating. So I, I'm going to be looking more into the hag. So interesting. Roger, how about you? And any of those uh, entities that, that uh, Mike listed out, any of those stand out to you or anything, any thoughts you have on it? Yeah, I think the the two that stand out the most to me is the because um, I've had uh, people that I know have talked about seeing shadow people, but the thing that they remember the those red eyes and that they see them and then once they look at it, sees all those red eyes, then it just like it's gone, right? And um, so definitely that's something that I think a takeaway topic for me is to really research that some more to try to understand that and then what you talked about again. It's just that kind of like shapeless mass because um, that was very similar to what happened when I was at the theater looking up and, you know, there was something there that was shapeless. It wasn't it wasn't just dark. I mean, I could actually physically see a mass. So those are very interesting. But I do have to say that uh, part of me just uh, I'm really, really curious about the hat man because I've never seen the hat man and really want to understand your experiences more, both Seth and Jim. Right on. Well, cool. Let's uh, let's kind of segue now that we know the different kinds of shadow beings and entities that are being reported out there. Let's talk about uh, the interdimensional aspect. That's that's one of the the possible scenarios of what some people think these uh, shadow beings might be is interdimensional beings or entities of some kind. So when we say interdimensional beings, what exactly are we talking about? Uh, what is an interdimensional being? And the thing that makes that particular statement hard to explain away is because, again, we don't have a lot of data to actually give us some kind of a, you know, to form a solid hypothesis that we can then verify or falsify. So... Interdimensional is kind of open to interpretation, I think. So when when I hear the term interdimensional, what I think of is there is a um, a being, whether it has a what we would call a physical body or not. Uh, for now, we'll say that that particular aspect is irrelevant. We'll just say that they're these beings, these their energy, again, their consciousness, their life force, whatever you want to call it. I believe that they exist within the same space that we do on this world, perhaps. Like, for instance, if we could have that that uh, barrier that separates the living from the spirits of the dead or the disembodied, if we could, you know, peek through that veil, as it were, and see into, quote unquote, the spirit world, what would we see? Well, I believe that we would see a world that looks exactly like ours. It looks like maybe perhaps even a mirror type of a world to ours. And we would see these, these beings, these, these, uh, this energy, these, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd see our deceased loved ones. We'd see all these other people that have passed, but they occupy the same physical space that we do, if that makes any sense. But perhaps what it is, is they're vibrating, their energy vibrates at a different frequency than ours, and therefore we're not able to see it with our own eyes. But as May and we've talked about already, that toroidal energy field, I think that that's probably something that not just people that have a body of flesh and blood possess, but I think that that toroidal energy field is something that... Uh, these other beings that these, you know, whether they are bodies of the deceased, uh, you know, spirits of the deceased, or whether they are just beings that, for whatever reason, they live in a different dimension, a different plane of existence than we do. Um, you know, and, and Dr. Michio Kaku has, gives this great uh, description of imagine if you're in a beautiful Japanese garden, right? And you see this lovely pond with goldfish or koi as they call them you know koi big gigantic goldfish <laughs> and you see them swimming in the pond right we can see them 
we don't know if they can see us necessarily, but what happens if we were to reach down and, you know, catch one of these koi and pull it out of the water? Imagine, you know, what is going to be going through the mind of that, that fish that is now, he's been pulled out of his environment where, you know, call it his dimension underwater, where he's swimming around, where he can breathe easily and he can move, you know, freely in whatever direction he chooses to. And all of a sudden he's in this new realm and there's this creature that he just, he's never seen before. He can't, he has no idea how to begin to explain this bizarre creature that lifted him up out of, out of his, his realm, his dimension, his world. And all of a sudden, you know, he, he can't, he can't breathe. Right. So it's kind of like that same type of belief as far as if, if we believe in other dimensions existing and the theoretical Physicists have said that, you know, we have a three dimensional world that we live in, you know, we can see we can sense depth, we can sense space and things like that. But the fourth dimension, it is hypothesized is a realm where it's where you can, you know, time, you know, time is is what's comprised of in the fourth dimension and how we're able to see that we don't know, but we can see things in three dimensional space. But what if in these other higher dimensions, it would therefore make sense that they can see things in a completely different perspective than perhaps we can even begin to comprehend. You know, we can see things that are, you know, we can detect that, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking in the, the corner of my room here and I can see, you know, where the walls come together. I can see the angles there. I can see how, how far uh, height wise it goes. I can see the depth. I can see the width. You know, if I pick up my phone here, I can touch this phone and I can see that, you know, it has, whether I look at it from whatever angle, you know, the perspective changes. So I guess, you know, these other dimensions, if these beings live in a higher dimension than we do, you know, say four, five, six, you know, I've, I've heard some people hypothesize that there may be as many as 11 or 12 uh, total dimensions. And each one of those dimensions, it would seem just as with like a, a two dimensional world where, you know, you take something and you draw it on a piece of paper, that's two dimensional, right? Well, how do we go about rendering and explaining something if something is coming from that fifth or sixth or even that fourth dimension? And the answer is, I don't know. So we have to accept the fact that, you know, if we can sense certain energy readings, certain, again, certain vibra vibrations and certain frequencies that give an indication that there are things there that we can't see with our eyes and that maybe we can't hear. We already know that infrasound exists. The human hearing range is like uh, from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, you know, or 20 kilohertz. And, you know, you have these animals that 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 communicate or that, that work with the infrasound that is below that 20 hertz range. So, you know, just because we can't sense it with our five senses doesn't mean necessarily that something isn't there or that it can't be there. And so because of that, for me, and I know I'm taking way too long to elaborate this point and I apologize, but to me, that tells me that there is a very good likelihood that there is other dimensions out there. And of course, religions are going to call them, you know, uh, as you, know, you have the concept of heaven and hell, right? Uh, if you're Catholic, you have this concept of purgatory. Um, so who's to say that these are all really just the same way that modern science and physics would call dimensions, right? So God may live in a dimension, you know, his where, where he is. That's why we can't see him. He can see past, present, and future all at once. Time is not linear to him, right? So who's to say that there's not other beings which would, you know, by logic would tell me, you know, not just angels, but demons as well. Maybe they all have access. They can come in and out of those dimensions at will, just as we can go and dive into a pond or a swimming pool or an ocean. And we can see that there's a whole world, you know, when we go swimming in a lake or in, a, in the ocean or, you know, what have you. And um, so I, I, I think that that's, is, does any of that make sense or am I just, Am I just talking nonsense? <laughs> Bueller, Bueller, <makes> anyone? <laughs> makes sense to no. me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, I think another way of like really simple, a simple way of, of describing that is if you have a VHS tape and all of us are old enough to know what that is. There might be some people who think I'm speaking a foreign language, but a VHS tape, you record over it and you record over it and you record over it. And, and at one point you might see you're watching what you most mm. recently recorded, but you're going to see images from something previous because it didn't completely go over. So you've got this magnetic tape that has picked up these layers, basically, and they're going to bleed through. You're going to see these other dimensions every once in a while. I love the way you said that. Yeah, because it's like, you know, we're all kind of existing on top of one another is how I picture it. But we were not in this life given the tools with our physical senses to observe it at all times. Now, for some reason, at certain locations or certain times or certain events in our life that spark something that all of a sudden we're able to connect to it. And then it's like a muscle where like you had this muscle you didn't know you can use. And then you kind of start using a little bit more and you're like, are these things always there or are they only happening when it happens to me? And now I'm of the opinion that things are always there. Things are always happening all around us, right on top of one another. We're quantumly connected, all sharing the same space. Separation is just this illusion of whatever realm we're on right now. And uh, it, now I'm like, am I making sense or do I just sound crazy? But it's, it, we're, I, I think everything's happening all at once, all around us. And for some reason, at certain points, we can tap into it. And I think it's a that that magnetic recording over the tape that was kind of like i think there's locations where our consciousness can you know certain events like a war or a really traumatic event can can bleed an imprint on sites on the locations and i think shadow entities are connected or they're attracted to those locations and then people drawn to those locations shadow entities then oh you're attracted to this place too that's because you have this and it's like when you see a bee and right. you react and then the bee's like well let me check out why you're acting i feel like that's how shadow entities are <laughs> you know you, you go to a scary place where they're drawn to and then you get scared and then they oh let me feed off that uh right. so i i it's like yeah they're interdimensional because that's it's a fun word to kind of put in this big concept but they're definitely connected to us here and now because and I think shadow people feed off of us. Uh, so there's something about, you know, about this uh, dimension that they are a part of. I think you I don't know if that makes sense. You perfectly yeah. articulated yeah. that, as did you, May. <laughs> you, you both were spot on on that. Roger, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I completely agree with everything that you uh, uh, have all said and put so eloquently. Um, yeah, there. I think all things are interconnected, and just there's a lot of things that we just don't understand. Um, I think we have a a fundamental understanding of time and space the way we see it, but then, you know, I think we're just on the the, the precipice of that uh, those quantum mechanics and how things. Um, are different when you kind of take out that linear time and space and are able to go into a, a different type of dimension and uh, something that, you know, we can definitely talk in a later episode, but I've heard many, many different stories and having and being an experiencer myself of where people end up in a place where they were not intending to go and it's different and they don't recognize the town the people some of the vehicles things like that and then they continue to drive whatever and then they're back on their normal course so i do feel really strongly that um different dimensions do bleed over and uh mm. we catch glimpses of it and they catch glimpses of us and when it comes to shadow people i'm definitely spot on with seth that uh there's something about just whether our energy or how we go about doing our stuff but they feed off us and uh I think sometimes it can be that symbiotic relationship back and forth. So, mm. perfectly said. You guys, you guys are all just firing on all cylinders. Thank you so much. <laughs> you guys are all. I love. I love this conversation. I hope. I hope that our viewers do as as well. So, uh, another thing that that kind of uh, ties into this interdimensional aspect, and may you mentioned it briefly earlier on, was this concept of um, of time slippage. 
And there's a, a lot of people that use, uh, we're hearing this term extra temporal uh, as a possible explanation for maybe some of these UAP and UFO incidents uh, to perhaps explain this, this strange behavior and how these things may be, you know, existing somewhere else in time, if that, if I'm articulating it the right way. So, and, and Mike actually talks about it, not, not so much in the Walk in the Shadows book, but this, this is his latest book that Mike Ricksecker wrote. And it's fantastic. We just finished reading it in the uh, Skinwalker Ranch uh, Insider Discord uh, Ranch Readers um, group. So I got to give a big shout out to uh, all the uh, folks there at the uh, Skinwalker Ranch uh, Insider Discord. Uh, had a great time reading this. And this book is called Travels Through Time Inside the Fourth Dimension Time Travel and Stacked Time Theory. And again, it's from uh, Mike Ricksecker. And he talks a little bit about how one possible theory for some of these things that we see, not in not just in regards to UFOs or UAPs, but also with these shadow beings, is that maybe, like you guys were saying, something gets imprinted uh, from either the past or, for all we know, maybe, maybe in the future. Um, and those dimensions, because... Th think of it this way. We always hear these accounts. In fact, Mike, when he was talking about the description for the wraith beings, he talks about how they move very quickly. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen these videos that people post uh, specifically from the Gettysburg uh, National Battlefield. Mm -hmm. And there are these images that people uh, capture that they claim are images of apparitions or ghosts. And the one common thing about them is they move really, really fast like incredibly fast. And of course, Roger, you probably remember from our own church history, there's accounts of, uh, you know, heavenly beings appearing and how, uh, how quickly they appear to move. Um, and so you ask yourself why, you know, let's, let's say we're dealing with, you know, uh, the spirits of people that have, that have passed on or maybe angels, if you will. Why would they be able to move so quickly? Well, you know, one possible theory is, okay, in this current reality, in the bodies that all of us inhabit, this, this tabernacle of flesh and blood, as it, and some people like me have a bigger tabernacle than others, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm working on it, though. And um, so that means that we, we get tired, right? We, we are subject to getting tired. We, we get sick and we can die. We are also at the will of forces like gravity, right? We can only run so fast. We can only jump so high from whatever our natural abilities are that we are, are born with. And so my theory, this is just sheer spitballing speculation here. Maybe the reason why these, these spirits or these apparitions can move so quickly is because they don't have that body of flesh and blood maybe they're not subjected to the law of gravity at least to the same extent that we are um if they don't possess a body of flesh and blood can we assume then that they don't get sick and they don't get tired so therefore they can move at incredible speed or is it more simply just the reason that because you know they they exist in a different dimension that time is reckoned differently there and time passes differently there because they they exist in a different plane where the frequencies and vibrations are so different to what we experience here in our collective 3d reality and these are the things that keep me awake at night folks <laughs> <laughs> so yes i know i'm going way off into left field and i apologize for that folks but just it's just one of those things that i i, I think about it's like you know maybe and a lot of times we hear these accounts of what, you know, when people have a dream of seeing a departed loved one, or if they actually see an apparition of a departed loved one. And when they claim to have a communication with this apparition or this, this entity that appears to them, a lot of them talk about how when they're, when this thing appears to them, 
their mouth isn't moving. They're, they're speaking like telepathically from, you know, mind to mind. Well, I've got a theory for that as well. Maybe that's because, again, these things don't have physical bodies of flesh and blood, right? Well, I'm an audio engineer. I'm a sound guy. Sound is my life. I, I, I produce music and I'm an audio engineer. So I know all about acoustics and the science of sound. And on a very, very fundamental, very basic level, what is sound? Sound is nothing more than air molecules banging together. And so when human beings communicate, how do we, how does that physical process work? Well, we've got vocal cords, right? We have vocal cords that vibrate. And because of the, uh, for want of a, a better word, the density of your head, and let's face it, some people are pretty dense, right? Like, like me. But um, in all seriousness, though, there are different things that cause the factors for the type of voice the tonal characteristics of a voice that you as a human being have. And it's why everybody has a little bit of a different voice. So if you no longer possess a body to where you have vocal cords that are vibrating, would that not make sense then that if you're going to communicate, you're communicating with what? With consciousness. So it would there make, it would make sense to me anyway. And yes, I know we have derailed big time, Jim, and I'm sorry, but I just got to finish this point. So forgive me, folks. I'm so sorry. But maybe that consciousness is really what the prevalent life form is in the universe, what we are. And when we when we finally shed this body of flesh and blood, we become part of what the greater presence of quote unquote life is in the universe. Maybe there really is life literally all around us in the universe and it just doesn't have the same you know flesh and blood characteristics that we have and maybe because we're not able to see into these other dimensions maybe we're not able to see you know these things whether that's by design i don't know we can speculate on that all we want to but it makes me wonder if maybe that consciousness that we all possess that thing that we take with us as it were, when we die, all that, all the love and all of the, the things that we learn, I don't think that we leave that here when we die. I don't think those things decay and just go off into nothingness um, after we experience what we would call physical death. I think that consciousness lives on. And I think that consciousness that is us lives on in another dimension. Um, and again, there's me going so far off the rails so i'm sorry folks eddie I'll, i mean I'll, you could I'll even shut, say, I'll shut up now <laughs> jim you could even say that uh, not so much that it lives on but that it just continues to live where it's been this whole time right you know we're maybe we're of the illusion that our soul is here maybe it's already in that realm and we're just projecting you know like this is our avatar and we're just playing a video game back in the soul realm we're in the matrix yep yeah <laughs> Yeah. There you go. So that's, you know, again, I realized, woo, we went way off. No, well, that's, I mean, that's, it's, <laughs> you can't help but take those deviations and side trails when you have a shadow person, interdimensional being, spiritual, what's going on type of conversation. So yeah. I love, I love all the, you know, hearing you pontificate on yeah. all these different things. It's all intertwined. I mean, yeah. when you're mm -hmm. talking about, I mean, that that could be a whole other podcast because there again comes not having to use your mouth, your voice to communicate and to be able to do that. And I've experienced that also in dreams where I I know I didn't use my mouth. I communicated with an entity, you know, uh, hmm. subconsciously, or, you know, yeah, telepathically. Um, so yeah, so write that one down another podcast <laughs> another well, it's, topic. It's, it, it's like for me i i know you know my my parents have both passed on and i was very close to my mom and dad and i feel them i feel their presence around me all the time you know i know that they're they check in on me i know that they're watching over me and you know i but before they passed i knew that my grandfather who i was very close to who died you know almost 50 years ago uh, I know that he, you know, is still there. And that's, that's why I, I feel very strongly that, that the, again, that part that is us, 
our, our spirit, our life force, our soul, consciousness, whatever you want to call, I, I believe that um, its very nature is eternal. I think it probably existed before we were born, before we received the, you know, the physical bodies. And that's not just my, my crazy religion talking. That's just, it, to me, it makes sense that it, it has a, I think that we're on this journey, this, this progression through life. And I think that we never stop evolving. We never stop progressing. And no. I think that this, this, this place that we're in right now, this 3d reality, this, this world, this matrix that we're in, um, I think it's just one of those steps on the journey to wherever, wherever we're going. Yeah, I love that. Our soul it doesn't lose the momentum and, and the, everything we're gaining. We're not going to lose that. We're going to carry it and keep it on. I, uh, my, my thoughts. Yeah, agreed. Because I, yeah, I used to kind of like, you know, when I was agnostic slash atheist, I would kind of feel like, well, it's going to suck when all this work, you know, and, and exploration when I die and I just go to eternal blackness, you know? <laughs> uh, right. So it's, uh, it's a lot rosier of, of a view to, to be where I'm at now, which is why ironically, you know, I, I, I thank shadow or the hat man for showing up. Cause I don't know if I would have opened up to even getting back to the place I'm at now, if he didn't jar me and force it open. Right. So let's, let's kind of, uh, take a little detour here away from the interdimensional and talk about something else that is considered to be kind of shadowy. And that is the, uh, the legend and the mythology of the mysterious men in black and mm -hmm. uh, by men in black, I'm not talking about Johnny cash, even though he was the man in black, uh, not talking about the Raiders, not talking about Darth Vader uh, and you know, as has been popularized in, in culture, the uh, we're all familiar with the movies that had uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith, uh, the, you know, comic book series about the men in black and all that. So there there is actually a lot of accounts out there from people, particularly people that have had encounters with UFOs and UAPs. And this is where we get back into that UFO UAP realm. And these men in black are kind of like these these uh, mysterious, sometimes sinister uh, beings, pe people, you know, physical physical beings. And sometimes they are very clearly because they did, did they they introduce themselves as being agents of the government of the United States government. But then there are also accounts of men in black encounters where they are humanoid and human-like in appearance, but there's something about them that's just, just is off. And they're very menacing. They're, they, they talk weird and all kinds of stuff. And so I, I made some notes. There's a, there's a documentary that is available on um, uh, Amazon prime. And uh, I watched it uh, a short while ago and it's, it's really interesting. And it talks a little bit about the, the history of men in black. So I'm going to read you a little bit here about uh, men in black. So interesting things about these mysterious uh, men in black is that they usually go in pairs. It's not uncommon for them to be seen as a solitary individual, but most of the time they go in pairs, sometimes in threes. 1947 was the first recorded sighting of a men in black. And that was encountered by a gentleman by the name of Harold Dahl, D-A-H-L, who was a conservationist in Maury Island in Washington, the state of Washington. And in 1947, he was on a boat with his son and his dog, and they had a business, like a side hustle, where they were uh, gathering driftwood and then they would sell it to lumber companies there in the Pacific Northwest. So it was like a, a driftwood lumber salvaging type observa uh, operation that this uh, Harold Dahl was doing. And so one night he's out there on um, this body of water in Maury Island, Washington, and he saw six UFOs. And one of the UFOs was behaving as though it was having some kind of a trouble. Uh, it was like wobbling and, you know, whatnot. And this, this craft all of a sudden started dropping what looked like molten slag into the water. Well, eventually after doing that, this craft you know, regained its stability and they, you know, the six of them scampered off. So this 
material that looked like molten metal, this slag, some of this material actually hit his son on the boat and injured him. And it also allegedly killed the dog that was on, on the boat with that, you know, uh, I would imagine, you know, anything molten is going to be, you know, that's, that's going to cause hurt to, to, to anybody. So the next day, Dahl is in a diner and a man dressed in a black suit approaches him. And the mysterious man then recounts every single detail about Dahl's encounter uh, with these UFOs. And the only person that Dahl had apparently told about this experience was his boss. And so the mysterious man basically told Dahl, he said, look, you're, you're not going to pursue this any further and you're not going to tell anyone about it. You know, kind of like if you know what's good for you, you're, you're going to keep your mouth shut. So the Army Air Force, and again, in 1947 was when the Air Force was actually created. So this happened actually, I believe, a couple of weeks or a couple of days before the legendary Kenneth Arnold sighting, which happened before the Roswell incident. So this was still the Army Air Force is what it was called, not, not the Air Force. So the Army Air Force sends a plane to retrieve this mysterious slag, and the plane inexplicably catches fire while it's in flight and crashes and the entire crew perish in this crash and no record currently exists of what happened to either the uh the wreckage of the the aircraft or more importantly the secret cargo of this mysterious slag that was dropped from this ufo so in 1952 there's this uh author by the name of albert k binder and he was the first person to coin the term men in black and he wrote this book in 1962 uh, with a gentleman by the name of Gray Barker. And this book was called Flying Saucers and the Three Men. And as far as we know, it's the first written account of Men in Black. And basically what it is, is uh, this uh, Binder guy talks about how these three shadowy figures would materialize through the wall. And these figures were dark in nature. They were wearing hats, almost like a fedora style, and, Roger, they had glowing eyes. Binder believed that these three men were extraterrestrials that had come to warn him off further research of UFOs. So then in 1964, and if you're any kind of a UFO nut like I am, you'll recognize this name, but in 1964, Dr. Robert Jacobs is involved in an incident where a UAP is witnessed on film shooting down an ICBM during a practice flight at uh, White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. And we've all probably heard of the story about how this, there, it's a test flight of this uh, uh, nuclear missile, basically, and it's been, you know, it doesn't have a live ordinance on it, but they're filming it. They have this, you know, professional high-speed photography that's filming it from a, a long distance away. And Robert Jacobs is this guy, he's this PhD that's like a, you know, he was filming this and he gets called into uh, this major's office the next day at White Sands Proving Ground and they proceed to show him this uh, segment of the film that he shot where you can clearly see this, you know, classic stereotypical flying saucer craft is actually shooting multiple beams into this ICBM as it's going through its trajectory. And it's literally flying circles around. Like, you know, you got to figure this ICBM is traveling at, you know, probably supersonic speeds, I would imagine. And this flying saucer craft is literally flying circles around it, zapping it, you know, in multiple places of, of, the, of the missile. And what ultimately ends up happening is the missile, you know, Basically, they lose control of it and it explodes and, you know, they figure that it was, uh, you know, unsuccessful. So the uh, his, this major guy uh, that, that uh, Dr. Jacobs was was working for says, OK, tell me, what the hell are we looking at here? What is this thing? And Dr. Jacobs response is, well, looks like you've got a UFO here. Right. So then as they're as they're watching this video, there are these three nondescript men who are clearly from some agency within the government and they basically take 
the entire footage, okay? And um, so what happens is Dr. Jacobs, after this incident, starts getting harassing phone calls and he starts experiencing acts of vandalism at his home. And then shortly thereafter, two mysterious government agents that were not part of the CIA, they took the footage and altered it by removing all evidence of the UFO. And these two mysterious agents then told Dr. Jacobs to keep quiet or he would suffer severe repercussions. So here we have these, these accounts of these guys that, you know, in one instance, as, as Bender talks about, that they, they are very similar to some of the accounts we read of shadow people where they are materializing, as it were, out of thin air, literally walking out of the wall. And so he was, Bender was attributing their uh, origin to be possible, you know, maybe they're extraterrestrials because that was, you know, just where his mind went. And then you have this account with Dr. Jacobs, where you have these guys that are clearly human, at least there's no indication that he feels that they are anything other than human, that are these two nondescript agents of the government for some, you know, three letter agency, we can assume we still to this day don't know who they are. But they come in and they take control of everything. And my understanding is that Dr. Jacobs was actually a civilian at the time. So, you know, they can't come and tell a civilian, you know, you got to keep your mouth shut and we're going to confiscate this stuff. I mean, there's technically no constitutional authority that I'm aware of where they can get away with doing something like that, unless they've actually got, unless, you know, that footage is actually like some kind of top secret, you know, national security type of implication of which, as far as we know, there wasn't any. They just simply took it, altered it and said, keep your mouth shut if you know what's good for you. So several eyewitness accounts of men in black describe the agents as having very pasty, very pale looking skin or very unusual physical features, such as they may have a mouth, but they have lips that seem to be painted on, like with lipstick kind of thing. And they also appear very thin and they're very, you know, they're, they, they, they apparently like to get right up close to people. And they have clothes, clothing that doesn't fit them. And if you're any kind of a horror movie uh, fanatic like I am, there's a great horror movie series by a director by the name of Don Coscarelli called Phantasm. And they're all, there's like five films. And the central villain in all of these Phantasm films is this uh, undertaker. This They call him the tall man. And he's this really super sinister guy that is really tall and he wears these black suits that are very small for his size and it makes him look like he's a lot taller and i should add he also is able to jump in between dimensions so he's interdimensional this this uh, tall man from uh, this phantasm series and so these these men in black they exhibit strange behavior characteristics and some witnesses claim that in the middle of the interview, when these men in black uh, individuals are interviewing them, they seem to lose energy and then they will just end up leaving and cutting off the conversation abruptly, almost like they are robots or androids of some kind. They just, you know, like they like their batteries running down or something like that. And here's a name which, Seth, you might recognize, Richard Doty, right? Uh, he's a very famous figure within the realm of UFOs and UAPs. And mainly because he's considered to be a, you know, disinformation agent. I mean, that was his job. He worked for the Air Force uh, Office of Special Investigations, or the AFOSI. And his job was basically to feed disinformation to people about UFOs and UAPs. And Richard Doty, uh, now that he's retired, claims that the men in black are controlled by the Air Force Special Activities Center operating out of Fort Belvoir in Virginia. And they are allegedly an arm of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Now, prior to me reading this, I never knew that there was such a thing as the Air Force Special Activities Center. But, you know, that's that's what Richard Doty claims. And me personally, I tend to, you know, take everything Richard Doty says with a grain of salt because, you know, he was paid his whole life to 
purposely mislead and, and misdirect people. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one, but still interesting to, to, uh, to ponder on. And then the last bit here for, uh, men in black, there was actually something that occurred in, in, uh, my old stomping ground, uh, back in New York in 2013, uh, up near Niagara Falls, New York, there's a video posted to YouTube of this specific incident, and it's really creepy if you watch it, where an employee at a hotel in Niagara Falls had shot a very impressive video of a very large and vivid UFO hovering over Niagara Falls. Well, the very next day, the employee called in sick. And on the day mm. that the employee called in sick, there are two very odd looking men that are dressed in a very intimidating manner with with black fedoras and large black trench coats walking into the hotel and this is all captured on the security camera of the hotel and you can actually go and, and find it on youtube it's it's really i mean it's 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 enough to make you go wow i mean it's it's really really uh, compelling and so these two, uh, these two men in black, these, these guys that walk in that are seen on the security footage of the uh, hotel camera there, they walk up to the, the person working the front desk and they, they ask for this employee. And the person at the front desk says, well, the person you're looking for is, is not working today. They've got the day off. And so these men just started getting really pushy, like, you know, not wanting to believe that the, the employee was actually not there at that time. And the accounts of one of the hotel employees says that these two men were really tall. They were really intense. And she said they had like these blue eyes, unlike anything I'd ever seen. And she said there was just a, a, a feeling like an aura about them where they were just very like they were there to menace and intimidate kind of type thing. So. Turns out that, you know, this, this guy, this, this hotel employee, uh, you know, found out about this. And um, I don't know where, I don't know where it went after that. I haven't, I haven't heard, but you can actually see the security camera footage of these two guys walking in right through the front door, the right through the front lobby of the hotel. And you can actually see people stepping out of their way. And the hotel employees that kind of step out of the way are the ones that are interviewed later to say, there was just something about them that creeped the heck out of them like the way that they moved and just this kind of presence that they had about them. And as you can see, they look just like, you know, like uh, the proverbial secret Asian man or, you know, two dark mafia characters from the 1940s or the 1950s kind of thing with the fedoras and the big trench coats. I mean, something right out of the Godfather, you know, almost kind of like that kind of menacing, but um it's got to make you wonder if, you know, with these accounts of Hatman, and we're going to segue from this into your experience, Seth, uh, but you got to wonder these, these, these accounts of Hatman, especially the ones where they're wearing the fedoras, you have to wonder if maybe these men in black, maybe not all of them are actually government agents. Uh, maybe what some of these men in black might be is in fact, some kind of interdimensional being or something other than i hate to use the term anything something other than human that show up for whatever reason to kind of keep the whole ufo uap thing under wraps there's got to be a reason why not just the government but maybe something else doesn't want us the regular people to find out that there really is something out there that is truly extraordinary and unexplained that may not be you know, some secret government project. It may be far more complex and far more, you know, dare I say, sinister and, you know, something maybe something to truly be feared as as opposed to something else. So so that's men in black. What do you what are what are you guys? What do you guys have? A, what are your thoughts on the uh, legendary men in black? Oh, I have thoughts. <laughs> I mean, if you consider that these the, that first incident with the guy with the boat and his dog that this person showed up and knew everything that had happened and of course this predates the air force and and you know the osi and and it's someone that obviously knew what was going on it, without any other connection to that it makes sense to me 
that it could be something interdimensional. Um, it reminds me a lot of the author Terry Pratchett in his Discworld novels. There's the yeah. auditors. That's exactly the first thing I thought of. Is it's like the auditors, and then there's the yeah. the guys, the Marvel equivalent, basically. Because when I've seen it on Marvel, I'm like, oh, it's like the auditors. Um, the and TVA. <laughs> who, who are well, the yeah, they're they're the ones that are watching and making sure things go as they're supposed to. And oh, oh you're not sure. supposed to get that information. So we need to, um, you know, eliminate that. And then of course they work by intimidation because they don't have anything lawful um, to, to go on unless you are looking at if there's any, you know, heaven forbid, there could be some kind of uh, coordination, some kind of cooperation uh, with a secret government agency, some some way to, um, to, to get that authority to threaten somebody, especially if they are already military or government and have that, that attachment. Um, and uh, so that really... That's what I first think of. And I have theories about the hats. Um, yeah, that's that's something I'll talk about later because it, it part of it is they pick a look kind of like with the darker shadow beings kind of trying to imitate the interdimensional shadow beings. It's we're, we're going to pick a look because this is what a human's supposed to look like, right? This is what a guy looks mm -hmm. like. You know, we wear hats right. and coats. And of course, the the hats coordinating you know, the fedora with the trench coat and the top hat with the cape. Um, it, it's like they just plucked a style out of time and put it on because, you know, look at me, I'm supposed to be a human, right? You know, so, yeah. But yeah. yeah I, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Roger. Oh, go ahead, no. Oh, okay. Uh, I was just going to piggyback on May and say, like, totally, like how you pointed out that that first men in black experience was before this i mean as far as we know before this government entity and i kind of think uh, like what you were getting i was like they just kind of picked okay well what's an archetype of like an authority something that will strike fear in the humans maybe that we can you know just walk into a room and assert our authority uh, i think that's how it started and i think like a i don't know if a true men in black is the right word but i feel like there is a true men in black and it's not human and then there are government entities that kind of have matched that and they try and piggyback on that and act like they're the men in black, but really they're just humans. They're part of our intelligence agencies, maybe other countries, intelligence agencies walking in, but the, the ones with their people say something's not quite right. And like May said, it's like, com you know, it's, it's, it's almost comical. Like they just picked like this, Oh, that's a human. Like, hi, I'm human person here, you know? Uh, but it's, so I, I think, I, I, well, I think there's something, obviously there's, there's, they are here to cover up something and our government is helping them and complicit. They're aware of them and even trying to copycat them. And, and like you were talking about with the disinformation agent of the Air Force, it's uh, guys like him are what makes it so hard uh, to trust anything. And, and of course, that's by design, you know, because. Right. There's know, a reason why I, everything is in, in, in the intelligence world is so compartmentalized and there's there's legitimate reasons for it. There are some secrets that have to be preserved at all costs but then you have something like this and it's a point that i've, I've always argued is that you know at least we deserve the right to know whether or not we are alone not just in the universe but if we're alone on this planet and whatever that truth may be i think we at least deserve to know that and it would mm -hmm. seem that these men in black and a lot of other agencies and i'm not saying that they're all necessarily nefarious but um it, it seems that there's a reason why they want this information and even just that simple fact of are we alone they want to keep that suppressed they want to keep covering it up they want to continue to discredit and um debunk and, and marginalize and and really kind of eviscerate anybody that comes out like a david grush um and I mean, just look at the stuff that's going on when, you know, Sean Kirkpatrick posted that thing and literally threw Travis Taylor and other people under the bus, uh, just vicious attacks, completely unfounded, making these allegations that are patently false and baseless. And the thing is, is that because these people have these positions in the government, they're going to be taken more seriously, particularly by the mainstream media. You know, it's like, oh, here's a guy who's an official representative of the Pentagon who is saying, yeah, there's nothing to see here. 
who's saying, oh, Congress were lied to and deceived and made to believe that. And your average person, they're banking on the fact that the average American is going to be completely clueless because they really are. I mean, most people and you really can't you really can't get angry at people that are ignorant because let's let's be honest. I mean, all of us are worried we all have to worry about where our next meal is coming from, whether or not we're going to have enough money to pay all of our utilities, pay for rent, pay the mortgage, you know, and then add on to that other things that just life gets in the way and life is far more real when it comes to things like that, that people really truly don't care about whether or not we're alone on this planet. It's like, oh, okay, that's nice, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm still paying $3 a dozen for eggs. You know, I mean, People that have that attitude are justified in feeling that way. And we've got to, mm -hmm. I have to constantly remind myself not to lose patience with people that are like that. But it just goes to my point that I was trying to make that there is clearly a mechanism in place and it's been in place for a long time to keep this information about something else being here on this world with us, or at least that has already been on this world and visited I think it's whatever it is, and it may be multiple things all at the same time, but I think it's still here, or maybe it's been here all along. But these men in black and these government agents, I think, for whatever reason, want to keep us in the dark, no pun intended. But mm -hmm. it, it makes me wonder, like you said, May, maybe these things are assimilating if they are interdimensional and non-human intelligence in nature, as David Grush and so many other people are now starting to use that that term, not ET, not extraterrestrial. They are non-human. Maybe that's what they're doing is that they are taking what they think that we as humans will be able to relate to when we see it so that maybe they won't look quite so bizarre or unique. Maybe they, you know, so I, I think that's a very, very valid point. Very much so. Rogelio. I just, I just want to say... Um... Just to add one thing there, um, if if you've never seen um, the series Fringe, definitely go back and watch it. The observers in there, um, I feel, are like the uh, the men in black of that series, interdimensional, right? Watching over things, manipulating the events. So, if you want some good sci-fi uh, action there, and um, really want to get your brain going and thinking, um, watch the series Fringe. It's an older older series with John Noble and uh, Joshua Jackson, but uh, really, really good sci-fi there. And uh, I think you would enjoy it, but uh, definite men in black. Um, and I do think that uh, very interdimensional and as I said, um, I think our governments or whoever um, human, right? They try to imitate that to uh, either coerce, bully, cover up, right? They are, they are using that power of fear towards people, but uh, I definitely think that there's a cross between the two for sure. Yep, I would I would have to agree. Thank you. So now we're going to uh, take the uh, the rest of the time that we have left. We're going to actually listen to uh, the encounter, the very personal encounter that Seth had hmm. with this entity known as Hatman, and then we'll wrap up with uh, if I can muster the courage, uh, my 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 own account as well. And Seth, as we enter into this, one point that I want to make, and tell me if if this applied to you when you had your experience, one of the things that Mike Ricksecker really drives home in his book about shadow being encounters is that in almost every instance, the person that had the encounter was wide awake. Oh, yeah. They were fully, they were fully lucid. They were absolutely insistent that they were not dreaming that it was not a case of sleep paralysis uh which would fall into what may was talking about earlier with the hagging phenomena uh so and i'll just preface my encounter by saying there is no question in my mind i was 100 percent wide awake when i had my encounter so using that as the jumping off point Seth, tell us, tell us about, uh, tell us your story. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, giving me the time and space to recount it and share it. That's, uh, I'll start out by saying, let's see, it was in my, I'm in, I'm in my late thirties now and I was, uh, 
this is probably about 10 years ago. I had just gotten out of college with my history degree, was waiting tables and was burnt out on it, was looking for anything history related. Found a ghost tour company in downtown San Antonio, and they gave historical ghost tours uh, around the Alamo. They also did dinner tours. They worked really closely and still do work really closely with the Minger Hotel, one of the oldest hotels here in San Antonio. Beautiful. Uh, many parts of it are still very historic and date back uh, to the way it looked long ago. It's right next to the Alamo, which is a huge hot spot, energetic area. Um, and uh, I, I applied because I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not into ghosts. At the time, I was totally atheist about anything like that. Uh, but I was a theater kid. I'm a musician. You know, I like being on stage and having people listen to me. So I thought, oh, this would be fun. I'll do it for a while and see if I like it. My wife really talked me into it. And I'm glad she did. So after two years of doing this, no experiences for two years, um, my drummer died, you know, usually stuff like that happened. He was a best friend, a brother, uh, you know, only way could have been closer if it was an actual, you know, one of my brothers, but, uh, and that was like a first, uh, friend, you know, that I'd had die where it was very sudden, very similar lifestyle. So it was just a huge shock to me. Uh, so I think that my, my going back to this place that's known for being haunted, plus being in that state of mind, all of a sudden, after two years of nothing happening, I start feeling things. I'd be giving a tour and I'd feel a kid tug on my vest because I was wearing an old cowboy getup. You know, I feel somebody tug on my vest. So I'd go, okay, you know, it's a family friendly tour to turn to answer this kid's question and no one would be there. Or I'd feel someone kind of nudge me like they were trying to get behind me, you know, because we'd be out on the street. Uh, passerby people would be walking by and I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, sir, let me get out of your way. And no one would be there. And the people on my ghost tour would look at me like I'm a crazy person. So these things start happening more and more frequently. And because I was so atheist about it, I'm not connecting. I'm just saying, ah, it's weird. Uh, elevator and the hotel is opening and closing and opening and closing, going up and down like crazy as I'm waiting for my tour groups to eat dinner. And I'm thinking, oh, that's weird. The elevators have really done that while I've been here. Um, one night, we're in this one part of the hotel because uh, we had a very limited area that we got to walk around. The manger's still active. But, you know, we're not going to walk down everybody's hallway. But after the dinner, we'd get to go upstairs in one of the older lobbies and hang out. And uh, next to this one stairwell, I started feeling really sick, like hungover. I, I wasn't drinking at the time. Uh, I used to, but I'd stopped. So I knew, um, is this food poisoning? I don't know. Okay, hold it together, Seth. Get through the tour. It's an hour, hour and a half. So throughout the tour, I'm just constantly fighting this nausea. And we leave the hotel and we walk around the Alamo Plaza. And at the end of the tour, we're outside. And I say, okay, guys, have a great night. For anybody going back to the hotel, you can all, I'm going to walk back the shortest way. If you're going somewhere else, see you later. You know, I'm saying my thank yous and goodbyes. And that's when I'm like, I can't hold it in anymore. And I'm like, excuse me. And I find, I just go and I start duking. And I'm really worried that the people that, you know, because we live off of tips and reviews and I just told everybody to leave me a review on our website and I'm worried uh, they're going to think I'm a drunk or something that I'd been acting weird all night and then I throw up. And so I'm really like, oh, I don't know what's happening to me. Uh, and, and sometimes you, you throw up and you feel better. I did not feel better. I just felt, felt worse. So I was like, I don't know what's up with me. I need to get home. And at this point, a, a woman on the tour is like, Seth, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, great, here it is. And I tell her, I'm like, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me. It might be food poisoning, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not a drunk or anything. I, I'm so sorry. I don't know why that happened. She goes, no, no, it's fine. I just needed to tell you when we left. She goes, we were upstairs in that hall, that, that stairwell. And I felt something attached to our group, something negative, a darkness. And it left the hotel with us. And she was like, the whole trip, the whole tour, I was trying to figure out who in our group of like 10, 15 people it was attached to. She goes, it's you. Uh, and as she was talking to me, she was like, this thing uh, likes you because it, 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 it said it's based at the Minger, but it knows you will bring it back. It can connect to you. It, you can, it, will, it goes home with you because it knows you will always bring it back to the Minger. She's like, how long have you been doing this? Like, A long time, you know, two years. Uh, and, and of course I'm still like, whatever about all this, this lady's, you know, I, I was very open and, and non-judgmentally in my disbelief, but I just didn't believe it. Uh, so I was like, oh, okay, very interesting. Wow. But I did think it was really weird that she picked up on that stairwell because that's where I started feeling really bad. So 
I was like 50, 50, like, Ooh, is, is this legit? And then also like, no, I'm just sick. And as I'm walking back to my car, another woman stops me. Someone not on the tour. It's an older woman. Uh, and she's like, uh, <laughs> she calls me mijo, a term of endearment in Spanish. She's like, mijo, I need to pray for you. Can I pray over you? Again, didn't believe I had a very religious background. So I still very much respected faith and the power of prayer. And I said, absolutely, you can pray for me. I'm a nice guy and I wasn't feeling great, but I, you know, okay, sure. Uh, and uh, as she's praying over me, I feel like water uh, just going down my head and down my back. I don't know why. I've never felt that liquid sensation in prayer before, but just liquid going down on my back, down the back of my neck. Uh, so I thank her for the prayer. I walk back to my car because I parked a couple blocks from the hotel. Hated paying for parking. So I would find the free parking. So I get to my car. Uh, and all the lights are on inside my car. I get to work about 5 p.m. I get to my car after the tour about 10 or 11 p.m. So it's 11 p.m., all the lights in my car are on, and I assume somebody broke in. So I'm walking into my car very cautiously because I think, great, someone broke into my car. All the doors are locked, but every single light in the back, every reading light is on, like the push button once. And mind you, I would work four days, be off for three days. This was my first day working after three days of being off. I didn't drive those three days because I lived downtown. So as I'm driving home, after turning off the lights, I'm thinking, man, how did those lights get on? Because if they were on, they would have been on the whole three days I was off of work because I didn't drive, didn't have to. My wife and I live downtown. I would have noticed them as I drove into work. Wow, that's really weird. And as I'm trying to figure this out, I feel someone in my back seat. I keep looking in the rear view mirror because I feel like someone is, and a guy in a top hat is sitting back there. Uh, and it's just so weird. I'm like, whatever. Uh, so I go home and I'm still feeling really awful. And one thing I did do, the first woman that told me that she sensed the entity, she told me, go home and we're getting to the power of belief. She said, go home and whatever you believe in, you need to appeal to. You, know, you need to pray to whatever you believe in, surround yourself with things that mean, have, have meaning to you and power. At the time, I, I didn't believe in God. I didn't pray. I didn't do any of that. I kind of was into crystals. I really loved Oak Island. So I went home, I pet on Oak Island. And I got my grandfather's uh, college ring and I put it on because my, my uh, grandfather, my mom's dad, just, you know, just if I think of uh, strength, uh, you know, he pops up right away. So I called on my grandfather. I watched Oak Island and I, just, I didn't really feel that much better. And uh, this, this went on for a while. A couple more months continued where I would just feel sick at work. I'd get to work and I'd feel anxious. Um, I told my wife about what I was seeing. I didn't tell her right away. I you know, just told her, I felt sick. Did you get sick tonight? Because we had the same for dinner. She didn't get sick. So I, well, that was weird. Why did I get sick? So a couple more days continue. And again, I keep seeing as I'm driving home every night, same hat man in my back seat. And then we had a detached garage. So I'd go out to do laundry at night. And as I'd come out of the garage, there'd be a man in a hat at my front door. And you know, when you get that feeling, when you walk into a room or out of a room and someone's there that you're not expecting. And before your brain even processes, there's a person there, you, you jump, you know, right. like, oh, someone's there. I would get that. I'd come out of the laundry room and, oh, someone's at my front door. It's a hat man. And then as soon as I, you know, really try and see, they'd be gone. Um, same with like in my rear mirror. It wasn't like I could really get a good look at it. It was very much like the, am I seeing what I'm seeing? No, it's not there anymore. Must not be it. And I don't know why it took me so long to really be like, what I'm seeing and trust my, I didn't trust myself. Like May was saying, you know, cause I, I very much had an internal dialogue of this isn't real. People make this stuff up. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so probably a month or two continue. I continue to have lights turn on in my car, seeing shadows and uh, skunks nested under our home. One night we woke up cause our, uh, my stepson, he was in elementary school at the time. He woke us up cause underneath his, his, uh, his bedroom skunks had nested and just were spraying. Uh, and it was, uh, our, our eyes were burning. We had to get out of the apartment. Oh, you know, yeah, it seems like an innocent stuff. thing. <laughs> skunks get under houses, you know, stuff happens. And, you know, it was unfortunate. But, and then another thing, our, our kitchen's just reeking. And my wife and I are tearing the kitchen apart, trying to find what is up. And we lived in an old duplex down by the San Antonio River. It's an old house, lots of little holes. A mouse had gotten in and died in the wiring in the back of our oven. 
took a long time to oh. figure that out. I had to call get maintenance to come and be like, find this thing for me. Uh, so like while animals are you know, dying in my house and just stuff that like hadn't happened, like just, I also was feeling like dealing with my friend's death. And every day I thought that I, I, I thought I had like the black plague. I thought I was going to die. Very optimistic person, very outgoing person. I've never been a germaphobe. All this was before COVID. All of a sudden, I became a huge germaphobe. I didn't go out. I got so anxious. I every day I would look at my calendar and go, oh, if I can just make it, you know, a couple more weeks, I'd be able to. Because I really thought I was dying. You know, and who knows? Maybe I was would have if I kept telling myself that. And throughout this whole process, the hat man is ever present, always there, um, just in corner of my eye I'd, I would wake up in the middle of the night feeling watched with lights on that shouldn't be on and uh, my wife had told me throughout this when I finally started talking to her she goes you know that's the hat man and I was like I didn't even call him that I just said I keep seeing a guy in a hat she goes the hat man Freddy Krueger's based on the hat man you've never heard of the hat man it's like a lot of people see this that was a eureka moment for me I had no idea uh, so then I finally was like well that's weird that I would I had no idea why would I, my, why would my brain try and create something that's not, I, so that, anyways, <laughs> that opened me up. I, uh, I really did embrace the, well, I need to find something that gives me power because I'm not, I'm not going to keep feeding this thing. I, I did quit my job because uh, I did feel like I loved the Minger Hotel, but I couldn't go back in there. I would just get so nauseated and sick and like dehydrated feeling. Um, I, I would feel things pushing on my bladder. Really weird, but like specifically, like I would know, I, I knew I would have an empty bladder and something would just push it really hard. Uh, and, and like I said too, before all this happened, I would feel little kind of taps and nudges throughout the tour. So, but because I'm a big dummy and I, I didn't want to trust myself, I always had a way to just kind of write it off. Like, oh, I'm just, I'm just silly. I felt something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I think I, I just kind of reached a point uh, throughout all that to where, you know, I, I, I had to, I just had to face it and, uh, you know, be, kind of really ask it, like, why are you here? Why am I giving you this power? And I very much did feel like it was my, the death of my friend. I wasn't learning lessons I was meant to learn. And uh, so I don't know if, if the hat man, it never felt super ma malevolent. I never was really felt like I was in danger. But again, I think if I had continued down that fearful path, I probably would have caused health problems for myself. Um, I, I gave myself an ulcer. I did do that. I'm, you know, cause I was <laughs> yeah, she was just stressing so much about it. So uh, I never had that like intense moment where, you know, I'm crippled with fear and there's Hatman. It was just, he was always there for like six to eight months and it, and it he dramatically changed my personality. Uh, uh, and, and it took a long time. I, I would say to me, it felt like how I, I had surgery a couple of years ago on her, a hernia surgery. And, you know, like a lot of people have had surgery, but it, it kicks your butt when you get surgery of any kind and you don't feel the same. And it takes a while to get back to it. Uh, it felt, it felt like that, but like on this, on the spiritual level. And, uh, I think it was probably like two years of me trying to find stuff. I, did yoga, skateboarding, music, anything that I, like that lady said, loved and held my interest in uh, uh, doing breathing and meditation and chanting really helped a lot, just lower my stress, get me back. But I, uh, I, I think my, my number one thing was my grandfather's ring, I, and going to the power of consciousness. Uh, he just, I, you know, it, it's like, we can be strong for others, you know? And I was like, you know, my grandfather would be strong for me. I'm going to be strong for him. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for the long-winded explanation. Um, but yeah, Hat Man, he, he, you know, he led me back to, uh, to where I am today, opening my mind, opening my mind up to God. And uh, so I would say to Hat Man, uh, thank you. Bless you. I appreciate you. I love you. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to feed you my fear, al although there are times where I can, I can sense him. Um, I haven't seen him. But I've gotten that familiar feeling a couple times in the last in the last year or so. But uh, that's how I think in the last year I've really started to try and find my spiritual path. So maybe he's uh, kind of hoping I falter.
Seth, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was, uh, thank you. that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, I, I, I think I hope it's, so. it doesn't, I, I don't it think doesn't it's feel a profound saying. It just feels like these weird things happen. And then, but when I looked at it with more perspective, hindsight's 2020, I was like, oh, wow, I was undergoing this spiritual attack first. Like, and it took my wife and other people telling me as I would go, you know, I'd show up to work and be like, man, these weird things are happening. And my coworkers who were very much in tune with that stuff, whether they were Christian or Wiccan or what have you, they would be like, dude, you need to like, what are you doing before you come into work? Are you praying? Are you protecting yourself? No, I'm just, I'm just hoping my good vibes see me through. Well, you know, uh, they did, I guess, up until I had that like, you know, mental breakdown with my friend dying, but. Sorry, I interrupted you. I just had that extra bit. To no, throw no, no, no apologies necessary. I, I think it's fantastic that that your encounter actually led you to greater peace and embracing something that that further strengthened, you know, your your spiritual side and that 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 helped you to find some direction and maybe some meaning in in an arena where maybe you weren't finding any at all. I think that's the importance of that can't be, um, can't be, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's, I, it's, yeah, I do feel like it was feeding off of, off of the state I was getting myself into. And, uh, and it, it wasn't easy to come out of that either. Like uh, I, that was 10 years ago and only in, you know, the last month would I even say like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Um, right. You know, and only in the last couple of years would I have even been willing to say like, yeah, I believe in God and energy and shadows, people and ghosts, even, you know, there's something, you know, people might object to ghosts, but that's just probably because their definition uh, is different from mine. But yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, I, there, there are people who've gone through so much. I've been blessed to, you know, to where that's like a scary experience for me because there's people who've gone through real trauma and you know, I'm always inspired by those types of people who come out of it and they're so much better and more empathetic and um, uh, empathy. That was a big thing it gave me because I used to get people on the ghost tour that would talk to me and I'd be nice, but in my head, I was probably a little too judgmental. Um, mm -hmm. So it, well, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, it, it, that's, that's our experiences, I think should grant us additional insights and wisdom and, and empathy. And that's, um, while my experience was the polar opposite of yours, um, I would say that one thing that looking back came out of it for me was also a bit of empathy. For me, because I had never really had what would be termed as a paranormal experience on this level, you know, um, I still to this day have never seen a UFO. I mean, weird stuff like that just never really happened to me um and it wasn't that i never believed that any of these these stories of ghosts and stuff weren't possible because again my my religious upbringing taught me that there is something else out there you know we do live beyond this this world uh when we die kind of type thing so and i believe in the very real existence of what we would call good and evil i think that's a very real thing um so i think that's fantastic that your experience was able to to help you you know find find your way as it were uh through that darkness no pun intended mm -hmm. um and i i think that's 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 good that that it's good for me to know that there are experiences out there that can help people find some meaning and some different insights that can help them get back onto a road that they're they're comfortable doing because it sounds sounds to me like what you experienced with your hat man encounter that it was like that term that uh mike ricksecker uses of emotional vampire from the standpoint that it, it feeds off of that negative energy it feeds off of that fear um and it it, it sounds to me like that's that's kind of like what what it was doing with you is that until you were able to finally find a way to stand your ground and um so that's 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 just awesome Seth. thank you so much yeah my pleasure and i you know thank you for uh giving me a place to share it because even even just like trying to 
uh, you know, gather my thoughts. Every time I tell it, I, I'm able to get through it. I remember the, one of the first times in the Skinwalker Discord talking to a few people about it. Man, I could like, I, I thought, oh, okay, I'll just tell this quick little story. And I, my emotions, everything was coming back. I was getting shaky. I was getting anxious. I'm like, you know, just like, and this time I didn't feel it as much. I was, I was a lot more comfortable talking about it because, uh, you know, I'm, I sound confident, like, oh, bless you, hat man. You know, like, I still don't want him <laughs> showing up and sitting in my seat and making me uh, sick and everything. But, you know, uh, yeah, it's, emotional vampire yeah yeah roger or may do you have have any any thoughts on that before i dive into mine well i i especially like your use of a one term precious object you know a talisman basically is that connection to your grandfather that ring that that important thing and i think that's really neat because it is um you know, when we think objects are just objects, but sometimes some have this meaning and, and they bring you this comfort and there is that little bit of power in that. And, you know, I have every confidence that you can can go about and you can do things without it, but why would you? I mean, you have it and that brings you comfort. And I mean, I've got college kids who take plushies to school with them on a daily basis and, and it's interesting because you know I'm like oh my gosh it, there's a point where we think we should have outgrown that but but that's mm. the thing you don't you don't outgrow the need to have something tangible um because especially mm. even if you're sitting there worrying and you're you know rubbing the ring or spinning oh, it yeah, twisting yeah. and stuff like that there you go there's that there's a comfort in that um, there's that physical that that energy there so I really appreciate you sharing your story because it is it is really neat and of course being native San Antonian I know exactly you know I can you know picture everything mm -hmm. <laughs> everything you're talking about where you're going and where you're at and um, yeah there's there's a lot of interesting uh, paranormal ghost history in San Antonio there's there's quite a few things yeah, I was always I was always drawn to it because of the history. And then once I got into like more of the spiritual and paranormal and you realize that like, you know, it's a Spanish it was a Spanish mission before it was a fort. And of course, you had that battle there, but just the fact that it was a mission in a, in a chapel is pretty significant because the Spanish always chose the sacred places that the natives used. Mm -hmm. You know, they would always just yeah. pit their church right on top of the sacred yeah. place for the Native Americans. So uh, you know, I, I think the Alamo is there for a reason that, that, that is an energy vortex, if, you know, another nebulous word, but it's, it's there. And the Minger is right on it. There's an acequia that runs underneath it. Water, you know, we know how water. energy oh, travels yeah. through water. Yeah. So yeah, the Minger, I mean, I, it was, I hated quitting that job because I fell in love with the Minger and when I, I'll go back and, you know, family and friends will make me, you know, set, take us to the Minger, let's go downtown. You can tell us ghost stories. Uh, and that building is amazing, but I still have to really be like, okay, Seth, you're okay. Like we're going into the Minger. And every time I walk in, I can, it's one particular part of the hotel where I can feel it go. Oh, welcome back, Seth. Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. 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 It's weird. But yeah, that hotel is, I have a relationship with that building as many do. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Roger, I get that same exact voice in my head every time i go to betos it says welcome back we have tacos for you. <laughs> see for me my 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 comfort my happy place will always be will always be tacos and bunnies right may <laughs> yes may, may and, knows where i'm coming from with the bunnies so yes and and i at one point i had to mute because comet was throwing her dish around again and, and jim knows that gets loud suddenly yeah. <laughs> i have a rabbit you know, just Aww. to the right of me. She lives in the hallway and it's yeah. a tile floor and she has a ceramic mm. dish and she will just toss it and you'll I'll see my gain, you know, signal <laughs> light up and I'm like, yeah. So yeah. Roger, any any thoughts from you before we move on? I was just gonna say thank you, Seth, for sharing that. Uh uh one thing that was super meaningful for me is just at the end there, just saying that how more comfortable you've gotten and being able to share the story and being able to do it more confidently and again express that but also just in your own words right so people like as you walk me through that um 
you know, I could see in my mind the things that were happening to you and even feel just some of the, you know, some of the feelings that I, I can imagine that you felt. Um, and so again, it's one of the things that why I really enjoy this topic of the paranormal um, is knowing that I'm not alone in the things mm -hmm. that I see, I feel, I experience. Um, and your experience again is amazing, terrifying, because right when it first happened, you really didn't know what was going on, but being able to work through that and uh, really gaining some more knowledge and insight into yourself, who you are, your family, and having that bond um, has really, in, in my opinion, you know, just my short interaction with you, you know, you are a great person, um, right? You, you love family, um, you love history, and there is, I, I get that great sense about you and that uh, I'm, I'm always happy to hear that with terrifying situations or things that we don't understand, have a positive outcome that pushes forward. Um, and that again, like these experiences that you have, you're not alone in having those. And mm -hmm. it's just one more voice sharing that experience and saying that although we don't understand it, things will be okay. And we have the power to, yeah. to move that forward. So thank you. No, oh, thank you, Roger. And I will just echo what Roger says, uh, Seth, you are indeed a good soul. And uh, right you know, back we're, at you. We're, we're, we're definitely drawn to the, uh, the great, great vibe and the great spirit that you have. You're just, uh, you're just, you're just one of my favorite people, Seth, truly. <laughs> and the fact that you're a musician, come on. And we got to talk about that, Seth. Um, folks, uh, is it uh, your, your, your project is called as a moth, right? Yeah. As, as a moth, as a, a moth, as a moth dot And yeah, uh, yeah. please folks go check out Seth's music. He's a fantastic guitar player. He's uh, got a great ear for music and you guys know me. Music is what I do for, uh, that's, that's what I am. I am the music guy. I, I produce music professionally for a living. And um, I can tell you that Seth has got some great stuff that he does. And Seth, you and I got to collaborate sometime, right? Yeah, I mean, that'd be fun. You're, you're, you're just amazing. I would love, love to do that. We can uh, bring Roger on board and we can make a, do, do an acid polka or something yes. like that. I mean, bluegrass disco. Yes. <laughs> yes i love all that you're too kind i they're just it's just a bunch of demos but i i appreciate the shout out if there was anything i was going to promote it would be that music is is uh it's everything i mean it's yeah it's, music uh, is the true universal language it really is truly yeah and may i think you would love his stuff he's he's got some great great music and uh as a moth dot bandcamp dot com is where you go to find that folks yeah well gee folks look at the time uh we ran out of time oh, sorry, oh no jim oh sorry, no jim sorry, sorry. <laughs> we, uh, wish i could tell yep. you my story but we're out of time shucks golly <laughs> darn no um i i do apologize to those of you that are watching this is is going a bit longer than our two hours that we anticipated so if you're still with us thank you and to all three of you thank you for well, it's around. probably my fault. I talk. No, no. Much. Are you kidding? Come on. I'm the guy. I'm the New Yorker. I talk way too much. <laughs> so, but um, we'll wrap this up, folks, with with me uh, telling my my encounter. And I I want to preface what I'm going to be saying by giving you a little bit of background and reemphasize the point that I prior to this encounter, I never had anything like this happen to me. And I came from a very stable religious upbringing and to say that any of my friends that know me that know that i'm a member of the latter-day saint faith know that i am not at all your typical latter-day saint or your typical mormon i may not look like it here but i have quite the foul mouth on me and i'm proud of that because i'm i'm a new yorker and that's just how we are ask roger you go with a, you, you see me while I'm watching a Raiders game or an RSL match or anything like that. You're going to hear a lot of colorful language. Let's put it that way. Or if um, there are no tacos close by, there's. I've I've always felt more comfortable around people that are not Latter Day Saint and not Mormon. Part of that is because where I grew up in New York, there's just not, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, there were not a lot of Mormons in New York, and I was always. Um, made fun of i was always teased i had friends whose parents wouldn't let 
me play with the kids because they knew that my family was Mormon. Uh, I got beat up a couple times because kids knew that I was Mormon. And, you know, so I, I know what persecution is all about. And I, I've never really felt at home around my fellow, fellow Latter-day Saints because I'm not, you know, I don't want to be one of these what we call Peter Priesthood kind of guys. You know, I like I like my rated R movies. I like, you know, I I live in the real world, and that's not not meant to be a slight against my my fellow Latter Day Saints. It's just that because I grew up around non Latter Day Saints, uh, that's just the crowd that I always gravitated towards. You know, and um, you know, I like I like telling bad you know off color dirty jokes just as much as the next guy i'm hardly at all what you would call politically correct when i'm not in front of a camera <laughs> you can put it that way but that notwithstanding i do have a very strong belief in my particular faith i have a very strong testimony uh, as we call it as latter-day saints i believe in the doctrine of my church and as with anything i don't need anybody else to validate that belief because that that is that is my own belief that i have and if somebody doesn't hold that same belief i openly respect and accept that um if people are not going to believe what i'm about to tell about my experience that's fine i don't need you to believe what i'm about to tell you because it happened to me and why it happened to me i have no freaking idea i'm still trying to put this together um, as I said at the beginning, my encounter happened almost one year ago to the day of today. And a year later, I have only recounted this story to my wife, to a couple of my siblings. And when I was at Phenomicon last year, there's this thing at Phenomicon called the Voice of the Believers, which uh, you've probably heard Roger and I say is our absolute favorite add-on event at Phenomicon. That is the one add-on event that everybody that has an interest and really truly wants to get the true spirit, no pun intended, of Phenomicon attend the Voice of the Believers um, open mic and dinner. And so I worked up the courage to tell everybody that was in attendance because it's a very safe space. Uh, there's no judgment involved with the people that share their stories at this event. And I worked up the courage to tell my experience that uh, I'll tell you guys about right now. So what happened is I'm, I'm somebody that has difficulty sleeping every single night. I, I do take medication that's supposed to help me fall asleep. Uh, sometimes it works. Most of the time it does not. And the reason for that, I honestly don't know. Uh, I just, I'm one of these guys that I have to literally think myself to sleep. I'm not one of these people that, regardless of how exhausted or how tired I am, I'm not one of these people that can just simply lay my head down on the pillow and then I'm out like a light. I can't do that. And I've never been able to do that ever since I was a child. I I just have so many things going on in my mind. My mind is constantly, you know, I'll be dead tired and I'll be like, hmm, do you suppose fish talk to other fish? You know, kind of like the old <laughs> Bill Bill Engvall comedy thing, you know, little stupid thoughts like that, you know, and just like these little things will just, I'll just get on this thought topic. And next thing I know, two hours have passed and holy crap, I got to wake up in two hours and get to work. And so that's what almost every night is like for me. I just, I have difficulty sleeping and it's not at all uncommon for me to go a full, sometimes two days without any more than maybe 45 minutes of actual sleep because my mind just does not shut off regardless of how tired I am. And that includes, you know, I don't drink a lot of caffeine, even though I do love Mountain Dew and stuff. I just, I'm not, I don't drink a lot of caffeinated beverages anymore. So this one night a year ago, it was about, it was a typical night for me. I was trying to fall asleep and I just got all these random nonsense thoughts going through my mind. And I'm turned away from the outside wall of my bedroom. <clears throat> and just to kind of paint you a window, uh, paint, paint you a picture of what my bedroom is like. I've got the, I've got the bed and then there's at the foot of the bed, there's a, 
a little gap where there's a, a dresser and then there's the, the uh, doorway to the master bedroom. And then I got a computer desk that's off on the, uh, if you're, if you're staring at the bed, the computer desk is on the right hand side. Well, I was, I was laying down and I was facing away from the computer desk. So the computer desk is on the outside wall uh, toward the outside wall of my bedroom. And so I'm just tossing and turning and tossing and turning. And then I'm, I'm turned away from where the, uh, the bathroom wall is. And all of a sudden I lay over flat on my back. And like now I didn't have my glasses on cause I don't have my glasses or my hearing aids in when I'm sleeping. And I rolled over on my back and there was some light seeping through the blinds. And I happened to look up to where the bathroom was, the, the door frame for the bathroom. And I saw what looked like this person standing there. And of course that startled me. And I, you know, I'm, I'm looking, trying to adjust my eyes, reach for my glasses and put my glasses on. And sure enough, there is this figure tall as all get out. Now I'm, I'm six foot two. I'm a, I'm a fairly tall guy. Um, and I would say that this thing was, uh, it was, it was, it appeared to be taller than the doorway to my bathroom. So you got to figure that's got to be close to seven, seven and a half, maybe even eight feet. So this thing was tall and I, you know, just this all unfolded so quickly. So I've got my glasses on, I can see this thing and there's this, 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 it's this big, large figure. I cannot for the life of me make out the features on its face. It just looked like a complete void where it's, where its face was, but I could tell that it was wearing a top hat. And when I say top hat, I'm not talking like Abraham Lincoln, you know, stovepipe really tall. I'm talking like something that you would see people in the early 20th century, like the, um, 1920s type period, you know, before the Great Depression. It's like somebody in high society would wear. And this figure, I could tell that it was also wearing, it was dressed very nicely. It had like a tuxedo and it appeared to me that the tuxedo had tails. It also on its hands was wearing these, uh, you know, women would call them dress gloves. They were gloves that a lot of times in those old high society times you would see men would wear these 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 gloves as well when they would go out and he also had a cane and this cane was not the type of cane that he needed to walk because you know he had a, a, a debilitating injury or something like that again the impression i was left with was that this cane was something like again you see these high society guys they'd go out and they'd have a you know a cane and you know um just, just kind of like that. So I get a good glimpse at this thing. And naturally, you know, this is about somewhere between three and four 30 or so in the morning. And my first instinct is, okay, there's an intruder in my house and being the big guy that I am and being a fighter by nature, I was, I, my first instinct was, okay, I'm going to throw this thing a beat down. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, throw this guy a beating. And um, so I immediately started to get up and the thought process is, okay, I'm going to swing my legs around. And as I'm swinging my legs around, I'm making contact with this, this guy's where his eyes should be. And again, I cannot see any features at all on the face. There's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no mouth. Everything else is perfectly formed, but I cannot see a face. As soon as I get a good look at it, and we're talking just a fraction of a second, I don't know how the hell this happened. And the only way I can explain it is it's like somebody flipped a switch in my head. And instantly, like, like that, I had a full recall of having seen this figure, this entity, many, 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 many years ago when I was a child. And when I say many years ago, I'm talking over 50 years ago. I'm over 50 myself right now. And 
I instantly had a memory of when I was roughly three or four years old. And this is when I was living back in New York. And when I was still a young toddler, now I, I come from a family of seven kids. So you can imagine my house was pretty crowded. <laughs> and there is a great deal of space between me and my other six siblings. So much so that there is a 10 year gap between me and the next oldest. So when I was born, all of my siblings were teenagers. And shortly after I was born, my oldest brother was actually uh, graduating from high school and on his way off to college. So my parents, because all the bedrooms were taken by my siblings, they kept me in a crib until I was about three or four years old. And I slept in their room, even though I was fully able to walk and, and everything else. It was just simply a matter of, of space growing up in a big family. And I had this memory recall that I have no idea where this memory came from, but it was a perfect recall of when I was a child on multiple occasions, I would experience what people would call out of body experiences, astral projections. And I've had a number of them during my lifetime. And I had several of them when I was a child that I was able to remember and I still remember. And they always were accompanied by instances where I was experiencing some kind of trauma. Um, for instance, two instances where I vividly recall having out-of-body experiences as a young child. There was one time when I was at church, and Roger, you, Roger and May, you might remember this back in the 70s and 80s, uh, children used to go to this, this program called Primary. And in the 70s, where I grew up in New York, they didn't hold this on Sundays like they do now, uh, alongside Sunday school and the main Sunday meeting for my church. They used to hold uh, Primary, which was this, you know, church-based activity for children from ages uh, four to basically 11 years old. And I was at one of these primary activities as a, you know, again, a three or four year old. And this older child, for no reason that I'm aware of, just began beating me up. And I mean, really viciously uh, punching me in the stomach, punching me in the face. When I was on the ground, he started kicking me and jumping on my head. And this is a kid that was probably a good, I don't know, four, three or four years older than me. So this, this was a much bigger kid. And as this is happening, you know, I don't know where the hell the adults were during all this, but um, this kid is wailing on me. And next thing I know, I'm watching myself from up above and I'm watching this kid literally kick the crap out of me. And I can see, you know, my my body just, you know, being pummeled by this older boy. And so then I can see one of the adults rushing over and the kid runs off and the adult comes and gets me. And you can see, I mean, I, I can see that my, you know, I've got blood coming out of my head and my teeth and my nose. And they take me inside the church and the same thing. I, I go inside and it's like I'm watching this whole thing unfold as if I'm in a room overlooking everything happening and I can see the adults kind of freaking out because my mother uh, was in another part of the church and the adults are freaking out and I can hear everything that they're saying and then it's like next thing I know I'm back in my body and you know they're wiping the blood off my face and and all this but I remember telling my mother that before I went back into my body, my I was going throughout the church and I saw her sitting in her meeting that she was having in this other room of the church. And I and and she said, Well, you know, what was going on? And so I I I described to her what the person that was giving the uh, the class or the discussion that she was attending. I was able to tell her exactly what this person was was telling the class that my mom was in, but yet my body is in this room on a on the other end of the church, and here I am, you know, in this astral projection, out of body experience, whatever you want to call it. And so when I 
get back into normal phase of things, my mother and I tell her this and she's like, I don't know how you can know that, but that's exactly what the, 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 the man who was giving the lesson was, was talking about. So my mom was like kind of creeped out by that. And then there's another instance where I was about three or four years old and I was at home and we had several relatives visiting from out of state. And in the kitchen of my old home back in New York, we had this spot in the floor that was right underneath where uh, a heater was. So there was like this constant warm spot and it was in the winter time. It was about, you know, I want to say probably February or March time frame. And I had these matchbox cars and there was this little circular rug that we had. And I was, you know, just playing with my matchbox cars on this, this little rug. And we had this, this large kitchen table. And you, as you can imagine, we had, you know, seven kids plus two parents. So nine people. So it was a good sized kitchen table. And it was one of those tables from like the 1940s and 1950s that had these, leaves that you could put in the table to extend it or shorten it and um the edges of this table you know the, the top of it was you know typical formica kind of uh top for the table and so one of these leaves had been taken out and somebody propped it up against the uh the counter and of course i was playing with these matchbox cars underneath where this large table leaf was and this table leaf you know probably because it had metal edges because they didn't have such a thing as kid safe <laughs> stuff and back in the 1970s and certainly not in the 1950s and 1940s where this table came from. And um, so however it happened to happen, I either bumped this leaf that was propped up against the counter or somebody else inadvertently bumped it and this big table leaf fell and landed square on the top of my head and penetrated my skull and needless to say it fractured my skull and you know that's i don't have any memory i remember actually i have a memory of watching in slow motion like this this thing falling and the next thing i know i come to and i'm in the hospital and they've got me strapped in this gurney and there's you know blood everywhere and the nurses and doctors are freaking out i can see my mother and father freaking out and then Next thing I know, I'm looking at myself from up above again, and I'm watching the doctors, you know, basically put stitches in my head and, you know, try to try to help me. And they knocked me out for the procedure. I was out cold and but I was able to watch. I'm watching the whole thing unfold and I come to, you know, however many minutes or hours later after they're done working on me in the operating room and i proceed to tell my mother and my father um exactly what the doctors were saying while they were working on me telling me the you know the type of anesthetic that they were going to be putting in me and what the measurement was you know like 10 cc's of lidocaine whatever whatever it was, I couldn't tell you now, but I recounted in exceedingly great detail the conversations that the nurses and doctors were having in the operating room as I'm completely unconscious, and but yet I'm watching it all unfold. And furthermore, I was able to tell them that grandma and grandpa, my, my grandfather, who I was screaming for the entire time, uh, I was able to tell them that grandpa and grandma got stuck in traffic because there was, you know, uh, they had encountered an accident on their way to the hospital and that's why they weren't there yet. And sure enough, within like 10 minutes, my grandparents show up and my grandfather fuming mad is talking about how they didn't get there sooner because they were held up in traffic because of this. Now, bear in mind, this is probably 1974, 1975. There were no cell phones. There were no computers. There was no way at all that I could have known that my grandparents were held up in traffic. There were no car phones, you know? Um, so the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm telling you all this is that I had experiences in my lifetime where I had these out of body experiences and in almost every instance, they were brought on by some kind of trauma that I faced during my childhood. 
and I had, you know, at least two others. Uh, and I had one of them actually happened when I was a, uh, a teenager. So it wasn't just something that happened when I was a young child. I have had these type of out of body experiences before, but they were again, always accompanied by some kind of physical trauma that I was in, that I was experiencing. So keep that in mind. So back to the shadow figure. And again, I'm ready to, I'm literally getting up out of my bed and I see this guy's face and all of a sudden, boom, these memories of having seen this exact figure when I was over 50 years ago as a child. And the way that I encountered it was I was having an out of body experience because my body was still asleep in the crib of my parents' bedroom. And my sisters all used to sleep in a bedroom that was adjacent to my parents' bedroom on the second floor of my home in New York. And through some reason, I'm having this out-of-body experience and my, my astral self, whatever you want to call it, is floating into my sister's bedroom. And I look, for some reason, I'm drawn to look out the window of my sister's bedroom. And as I look down into our driveway on the side of the house, I see as a child, this being that is standing in front of me right now as a 50 something year old man, over 2000 miles away across the country, not in New York. I am in my home in, in Utah. And so I had no memories. I don't have, I, I didn't have any, any recollection of, these things but this this figure this being appeared to me on at least three occasions in memories that appeared to me and in every instance it was one of those out-of-body experiences it was always at nighttime or early morning like it was happening for me this last year and I always got a feeling that it was there to menace me and it the the way that it moved when I saw it as a child really creeped me out and of course i didn't know what the heck any of it was all about and so the fact that these memories just instantly it's like it was like it happened yesterday even though it happened over 50 years ago so imagine that i'm not only you know caught unaware because this thing is actually in my bedroom but that also i have these memories coming back as soon as I go to place one foot on the floor and I've already got my fist clenched because I'm, I'm getting ready to, to lunge at this thing and just give it holy hell, you know, give it a good old fashioned Brooklyn beat down. And um, before I would say right as my foot is about to touch the ground, I feel this surge of like a zap of electricity. And then next thing I know, I am lying flat on my back and I'm still wide awake. I'm lying flat on my back, but I cannot move a muscle. I am completely paralyzed. I'm completely frozen. And so I can see this thing still. I've got my glasses on and I can see this thing is now starting to move towards me. And I am absolutely terrified right now because I'm you know, I'm telling my arms and my legs and my torso, get up, move, but I can't. And so by this point, I'm thinking, okay, I'm dealing with some kind of, you know, evil spirit. So as Latter-day Saints, we are taught that we can cast out evil spirits by just simply raising our hand to the square and invoking the name of Jesus Christ and telling it to depart. I couldn't even do that. I couldn't move. I, I still had my fist clenched like this so i try yelling out for my wife and i'm i'm trying to scream and you know get my wife's attention and i cannot speak i absolutely cannot talk i can't i can breathe but i can't yell i can't it's like words can't come out i've been completely shut down both my my motor movements you know hands fingers everything just completely like frozen and this thing starts coming towards me and i am absolutely terrified okay my heart is beating a mile a minute 
And next thing I know, this thing is probably, I would say, just inches from me and it's reaching out for me. It's, you know, it's, it's coming toward me. And I still, I can't see any face on this thing. Everything else is, looks plain as day. And it's just this, this figure coming right toward me. So the only thing I can think of is I can't, I can't say anything. I can't move a muscle. So I silently plead to God and I'm like, please, heavenly father, help me, help me. And Next thing I know, boom, like a like a zap. All of a sudden, I'm now standing at the foot of the bed. But here's where it gets weird as hell. I'm standing there, this new perspective at the foot of the bed, which means that I'm almost parallel to where this shadow being is. I look and I can see myself laying on the bed, laying on my back look of absolute terror on my face i can see my chest i can see the 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 labored breathing that i'm i'm literally freaking out i can see the sweat starting to form on my forehead but i'm looking at myself as i'm laying on the bed but i'm looking at myself from the foot of the bed not from up above from the foot of the bed and i'm like you know completely caught unaware like what the hell is going on and then all of a sudden this creature as it's this as it's as it's reaching for me and by this point it's maybe maybe a foot away from my body it's reaching and all of a sudden it stops and it turns its head and it's like it can see me now standing at the foot of the bed I have no idea how. So, of course, my next instinct is raise that arm to the square, cast this thing out. Try speaking. I still can't speak. There's no sound coming out. I'm trying to talk. I look and I can't, I can't see, I can't see my hands. I can't see that I have any kind of physical body. But I'm but I'm right there. I'm I mean, I can see I'm I'm conscious seemingly right there at the foot of my bed and i can see again my physical self lying on the bed wide awake eyes open freaking out completely paralyzed and then all of a sudden now hat man appears to actually see me in whatever i mean and i don't know i have no explanation for this folks this is part of why i'm having a hard time figuring this whole thing out Hatman turns and it's like he can see me in this this astral or this 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 other form. And I don't know how to explain it, but I got the impression that as soon as he saw me, I could it was almost like I could sense that the tables were turning and all of a sudden he was afraid of me. I have no idea how to explain that. So Again, I say a prayer to God. I'm like, Heavenly Father, please deliver me out of this situation. Help me. And next thing I know, I just feel this massive, I mean, it's making my hair stand up right now trying to describe it. I feel this massive surge of energy come over me. And next thing I know, I see Hatman go flying back like some kind of unseen physical thing just pushed him like shoved him but there was there was nothing there and it was like i mean he just he was it was like he was shocked that was the impression that i was left with and no sooner does he you know get realized that he's been pushed back by something out of nowhere these little other shadow beings materialize right next to him and they are significantly shorter than he is i'd say these ones are maybe maybe three four feet probably about four or five feet tall maybe but they were not as clearly defined as he was hatman i could make out every feature about him except his damn face 
And so he's there. And all of a sudden, these, you know, I just felt this real dark heaviness come into the room when these other beings appear right next to him. And I'm, I've just got this distinct impression that he is there and they are there to cause me some kind of harm. I don't know what kind of harm. I don't know other than the fact that that's what I felt. I mean, I was full on, this is like full on crisis mode. And I'm still looking at myself on the bed, completely frozen, like, like frozen in time, but I can still see my chest on the bed, heaving, you know, breathing, you know, a mile a minute. And so these other shadow beings, minions, whatever the hell you want to call them appear. And then they all start coming toward me. And so the same thing, I just, I say this quick little prayer, you know, heavenly father, help me. And again, I feel that rush of power, that rush of energy, like this absolute zap of electricity. And then I see them all go flying back and they disappear and disappear into the wall. And then that's the end. And the next thing I know, I'm back lying on my back, back in my body. And I am just, I mean, drenched in sweat. My, I, I feel like I was about to have a heart attack because my heart was beating so much. I felt like I was going to pass out. And uh, I, to this day, I have no freaking idea what any of that meant. And it doesn't stop there because a week or so later, I had an occasion to speak with a couple of my sisters uh, at the same time, they were all together in one place, all but one of them. And I asked them, I said, you know, just out of the blue, I, I said, hey, do you do you guys recall when I was a, a young baby uh, or, or, or a toddler, maybe three or four years old, do you ever remember me telling you about nightmares I had about this guy in a hat? And without hesitation, one of my sisters spoke up and said, oh, yeah, Absolutely. She's like, he's like, you, I remember you used to tell us that you would see this thing outside the window of our bedroom and how this, this guy in a top hat and a tuxedo would, uh, that didn't have a face would, would, would appear outside of our window and, and like used to scare you and do this little kind of like creepy movements. And, and I heard that and I was like, there's validation, that word coming up that my sisters just confirmed that those memories were real. They happened because they remember me screaming, waking up screaming in the night and me telling my mom and dad about how I saw this man standing outside of my sister's bedroom window and how he appeared to me multiple times. So all of a sudden I now have members of my family confirming that that really happened when I was a child. So that was kind of like, for me, the icing on the cake of what the hell does this mean? And I still, today, don't have any idea. I don't know what any of it means. All that I know is that it, it happened. And I was not sleeping. I was wide awake before it happened. And I can tell you for damn sure I was wide awake after it happened. Um I had trouble sleeping for several days after. And Roger, you you probably remember when I reached out to you because aside from my wife, you were the only other person that I could tell the whole story to. And again, it's like, I already know that there's a lot of you, probably most of you that are going to be watching that are going to say, oh, come on, Jay. That's nonsense. That's, that's bullshit. And you know what? If you want to feel that, that's great. That's fine. I don't care because... I know what I experienced. I know what I went through and why I went through it. I don't know my religion. And again, remember folks, I am a staunch believer in my latter day saint faith. I, you know, I have a strong testimony of my, my church and my beliefs in Christ specifically. And there are certain aspects of this that my religion can't answer at least none that I've been told yet. 
And has that shaken my faith? No, not at all. But I'm still trying to figure out why this happened to me. And more importantly, why did it happen to me 50 years after the fact when this thing visited me as a child? Why did it appear to me as a child? I'm trying to figure that out. What does this thing want? The only thing that I'm left with, and that's why I said with, with in comparison to Seth's encounter with hat man mine was 100 percent a belief a solid belief that he was there to menace me to terrorize me and heaven forbid what would have happened if it had actually because it was reaching for me what if this thing had actually made contact with my physical body what would have happened i don't know all that i can tell you is that it was absolutely 100% lucid and real when it happened. And um, he's been back to see me twice since then in the last year. But here's the thing. He hasn't manifested to me. But I remember what he felt like. And he has come back to visit twice since. And each time I have, I have been able to raise my arm to the square and cast him out and without any difficulty whatsoever and if i'm being perfectly honest the last time i felt his presence was about two nights ago and it happened when i was outside my house taking out the recyclables out to the recyclable bin and i just i it was about 11 o'clock at night and sure enough i just started feeling once you feel that presence you know what it feels like and i felt that very shortly after I took a couple steps outside of my house and I didn't see him. Didn't see him, but I knew he was there and I came back inside and that was that. So I know that there's a thing. It's an actual psychological term. There's a difference between suppressed memories and repressed memories. And I don't know which one of those applies to me, but there's something, there's some reason why my brain, my mind buried those, those memories as a, as a means of protection to prevent, to protect me from those, those painful memories. You hear of people that are, are victims of abuse that, you know, will go into this mode where they kind of just, are able to compartmentalize it and and it's what they do as a survival mechanism so was that what my mind did and why i couldn't have any recollect of these memories that happened 50 years ago until this thing confronted me again 50 years later in my bedroom 2000 miles away from where it happened the first time i don't know i mean i've even had people uh and we're talking a handful of people that i've even related this story to that have said well maybe you know when you were a child you had your mom and dad there to protect you and now with your mom and dad gone maybe this thing you know maybe your mom and dad were there as figures of you know protection and with them not being there and and i have a hard time believing that because that's not how my faith and my belief system works um but i still i don't know what brought this on? Because I'm not somebody that, you know, deals, I don't dabble in things like Ouija boards and tarot cards. I'm not somebody that courts this kind of thing to happen. And unlike Roger, who just these things naturally happen to him, they don't happen to me. And I, I don't, I don't know why that is. So, you know, I, I can understand if most of you or even if all of you just have a hard time putting this story together because I'm in the same boat. I don't know what it means. I don't know what any of it means. All that I know is that this figure appeared to me back in the early 1970s in Binghamton, New York, which is where I grew up. And all of a sudden, this, my mind, for whatever reason, gets wiped of these memories or they get placed somewhere where they're just not there and then 50 some odd years later in my own home i'm now married with three children of my own living outside of salt lake city utah 2000 miles away completely different house 
and this thing up and decides to make another appearance. And this time, unlike anything else, because previously the appearances were outside of the house. This time, this thing's inside, not just my house, inside my bedroom. I, it's just all stuff that I can't rationalize. I can't put it together. And maybe now you guys understand why I don't talk about this. Because even a lot of the other encounters that I've read about in Mike Ricksecker's book uh, and a lot of the other ones, there's some that have similar elements to mine, but nothing where it involves an out-of-body experience where I'm presumably my astral self calling upon the help of my spiritual beliefs is able to confront this thing and this shadow being can apparently see me in this astral form how is that i mean all this stuff i got so many questions i don't know i don't know what any of it means i honestly don't and if anybody does i'm open to suggestion uh i'm i'm ready to listen but it's you know i i'm sorry for taking so long and but hopefully hopefully you understand a little background of of why this topic is of such interest to me because it happened to me and that's why every time i encounter somebody that experienced a ufo or the a uap or had something similar my perspective has changed because i experienced something truly unexplainable truly terrifying and i now know what it's like to be an experiencer and if I had my choice, I I wish I could take it back. I don't. I still lose sleep over this. I mean, it's it's not it's not constantly. I mean, it's not like ruining my life or anything. But it's one of those things that is just it's unresolved. And when you feel that that's something like this so profound, when it's unresolved, it just it eats away at you and it changes you forever. Mm -hmm. And um. I don't know. Um, that's it. I guess. I mean, I, I I don't know what else to say. But that's uh, that's what happened. That was my that was my encounter, and um, you know, here I am a year later, still trying to make some sense out of it. And I don't. I I'm left with the distinct feeling that it's not the last time I'm going to encounter this thing. And I don't. Again, I don't know what it is. I don't know who it is. And I don't know why me, because none of my children and my wife, thankfully, have experienced anything like this. But here's one more thing that I, I'll leave you with. In talking to my sister about this, she informed me that her two of her children, her two oldest children, had the same encounter with the same hat man. Mm. And the extent, to the extent that when they were babies, about the same age as me, they reported seeing the same exact thing. Guy in the top hat, somewhere between seven and nine feet tall, wearing the top hat, tuxedo, gloves on the hands, you know, decorative cane that he's holding in his hand, doing these funky little movements. Scared the crap out of them, too, and gave them nightmares, which is why when I mentioned it to my sister, my sister, I could tell that she was freaked out. And when I told them my story, um, it just adds another layer because, uh, again, they confirmed that I had that happen to me when I was a child. They remembered it happening to me as a child. And here I have a sister who has children of her own that were having encounters that were similar to what I had when I was a child. So whatever this is, you know, again, is it interdimensional? I don't know. Is it a ghost? I don't know. Is it a demon? I don't know. But whatever it is, it's real because I was wide awake when I saw it. And um, nobody can take that. I wish they could because I don't, I, I don't like living with this. I don't like living with something like this that is unresolved without any kind of closure. 
So I know what that feels like for anybody that's out there that's had anything even remotely like this. And um, so, so thank you everybody for listening. I'm sorry for, for going on so long. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. And I think that you needed to take the time that you did because that's the time you needed to be able to get it out. I mean, it's not something you can compose and practice and, and say, but, and I have thoughts, but first I have to ask, you guys saw what was happening while he was telling the story. Please tell me you saw what was happening. Did you not catch? Three hours we've been on and his feed has been fine. But as soon as he started talking about praying, his feed started freezing and glitching. Yeah. And I cannot begin to describe the overwhelming feeling, the crawling uh, that I felt when that started happening. Because we had discussed this shortly earlier today, talking about these kinds of things, feeling like because he had the reoccurrence, feeling like there is something that doesn't want this to be talked about that this doesn't want people to have to normalize talking about it to um, because we said that people with bad intent, people who want to stay in power, they don't attack the weak, they attack the strong. And you are having this strength in sharing these stories. And so that that just really seeing your feed glitching up just there it is, you know, that anyone can argue that that's just your feed, your internet, whatever, but it's been fine for three hours. <laughs> and it just. Well, interesting to note. And, and Seth, you may have heard Jeff talk about this. And I, I only know what Jeff Freeman told me, but Jeff Freeman was sitting right in front of me at Phenomicon when I was retelling the story to the crowd there at the voice of the believers. And he had a tri field meter. And he told me that while I was telling those specific parts of the story where you could tell that I was mm -hmm. really kind of agitated, he said, Jim, that tri field meter went crazy. And he said, everybody else that he said, everybody else that was telling a story or telling about their different experiences, he said, maybe the meter would move just a little blip. But he said, when you were doing it, Jim, it, it went, phew. You know, he didn't say that it pegged or anything like that, but he said there was significant movement. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know what to make of that either. But that was, uh, you know, gosh, now that now that now that kind of gives me the willies, me. <laughs> I'm trembling. So, I really am so because I, it just just well, may, may, maybe now you guys can 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 see that it's maybe you can understand why it, it's it's been so difficult for me to talk in public about it and mm -hmm. now with this being out on the internet i you know subjecting myself to who knows what's going to come my way from you know detractors and you know people that are going to and I, I i quite frankly i don't care because again i don't need anybody's approval or anybody's you know to say oh well you know because it happened to me you know it's mm -hmm. and um once once you have that experience you can never go back yeah, absolutely. You don't need anyone's validation. I mean, it's just, it's, um, yeah. Wow. Just, um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Seth. Oh, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, it's funny. Like I've never since my, my experiences, I never once was like, Oh, what if people don't believe me? Cause I just didn't creep into my head head because I, I knew what I was feeling and seeing and I like like Jim said you know he wasn't courting anything that would cause for something like that to happen like I wasn't looking for that I was the biggest non-believer you know of ghosts in our ghost tour company and uh yeah like it, it's <laughs> we you know, we're not asking for these things to happen. And then when they do, you know, it's uh, it's like Jim said, like, I don't care if people believe me or not. I know what I saw. And people can say, oh, well, it's all in your head. Well, all of reality is in my head, you know, like, so, you know, it's then I can't trust any senses because. Well, yeah, that's they, they, <laughs> they, they, they're, you know, you hear people say, well, you can't prove 
that it happened. Well, you're absolutely right, but you can't prove that it didn't happen. <laughs> That's exactly. true. Yep. Just be yeah. just be just because you aren't, you know, willing to consider the possibility that's you know you're entitled to think that mm -hmm. but you know i i had this experience and and um i hope i never have it again i mean uh, that's that's the truth of it because this thing this thing I, I i i was left with the impression that it was there to harm me and in a different way than i think it was trying to terrorize me when i was a child and what really concerns me is, again, previously, it was always outside of the house. But yet this time, it wasn't just inside the house. It was where I sleep. I never saw Hatman inside my house. Every time I saw Hatman, it was in my car. It was at my front door. I would come out of, you know, and, but you saying him in the house and you're right. I never, he never came in my house. And when I was telling my coworkers, like, I keep seeing this person in my front door, they were like, you need to tell yeah. him he can't come in. And I yeah. finally started verbalizing stuff like that. But uh, no, there, you, I think you're, I think that's a good point to kind of, it's a solid point for you to get hung up on and kind of question. Cause I don't want to say you invited him in, but what, what, what my, changed? my, and my also, family, I, we, we pray regularly in my family. Yeah. I mean, we could probably be it, better about reading our scriptures and things like that. But I, you know, we, again, I want to emphasize the point. The only time that I even approach these topics is when Roger and I are doing a podcast. And this is, I mean, I purposely, there's a reason why I don't like to talk about spirits and hauntings and things like that, because that goes down a road where, my faith tells me that that stuff is real and I don't like dabbling in the darker aspects of things. And so again, you know, I'm not doing seances. I'm not doing, you know, I, I just, it's just not who I am. I'm a practicing Christian. I, I, I attend church as often as my, my health allows me to attend and um, how this, how and why that's, that's, that's the thing that keeps keeps coming back to me is the how and the why and of course the what what is this thing why I, and how i think may kind of answered it it's because you're you're strong you're a strong man in your faith uh spiritually physically um you know you might feel like this thing kind of left you shook you're still in it it only happened a year ago mm -hmm. um you you might not feel like it but i see someone incredibly strong and uh and and worthy of that strength that pushed uh these these entities away so i don't i don't think it's preying on on you because of of any any sort of weakness or or, or not the, not that you would feel well, like it's, you know but it's, it's you it's, i i you might not feel it but i just want you to know i see strength and power and uh, i see a a man of of god and, and his family and love and you're not going to get broken down. And obviously there's something in you, like you were saying with the out of body experiences, every time they happen, it was because you were about, you were up, about to undergo something extreme. So with the shadow man, to me, that connection is your body, your subconscious knew, Oh, I need to go into the astral realm zone because I'm physically frozen. I can't say my prayer. I can't enact my faith, but I can, you know, I can knock myself into the out of body. I've done that before. And then that shadow man, obviously, or hat man was not expecting that, you know, that, that gave me uh, good goosebumps when you described him, you know, almost like, what the heck? It's like in the matrix when the, when Neo gets his powers and all the robots are like, oh, yeah. snap. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's, 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 it is, yeah, it's, uh, to, to your point, where you were going through the negative, you know, where you were having, you know, the rough time when Hatman appeared to you and you having a lot of stress and things like that. I, I do have to admit last year was when I was really, when this happened was when I was in the middle of settling my father's estate and anybody who's ever had to handle mm -hmm. the estate of loved ones. I mean, it is a, it's an arduous task because I, and I, and May, I know I've talked to you about this and Roger, I've talked to you about this is, you know, I was very close to my parents. They were, they were like best friends to me, both of them and me and my dad in particular. So losing them was, was, 
was hard enough. Um, despite my belief that I will see them again and that they're in a better place, free of pain and suffering, He's but it doesn't it doesn't prepare yeah. you. Yes, absolutely, he just froze. Am I there? Earlier Hello? it was glitches. Now it's it's frozen Hello? solid. Am I there? Hello. Hello. Anybody there? Hello. Hello. There he's back. You there? Okay. Welcome right back. Welcome. Welcome. Okay. Back. Okay. <laughs> Skipping time here. Sorry. So, where I was before uh, it <laughs> interfered, I guess. I don't know. Hat man, you're a punk. Um, anyhow, uh, sorry, Seth. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I was going through a really rough time. You know, when, when you lose parents, there was a lot of uh, dynamics that I had to kind of control with with setting the estate in order and and making sure that my siblings were all everything was distributed evenly and fairly among my siblings and and um, just the stress of 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 that and you know having to interrupt my 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 work life. Um, and then as May knows, all the abuse and stuff that I was dealing with uh, in the music business with with uh, stuff pertaining to my old radio show and my former music project, Eminent Soul, uh, I was getting a constant amount of abuse from mainly people in Europe that just, you know, don't didn't like the the things that I was doing. And so all of that, I think, probably contributed to an inordinate amount of stress because these people, uh, particularly the, the music detractors were threatening my family with physical harm. They were threatening to harm me. They were, you know, sending really horrible messages and trying to turn me against my friends that I had in the music business. And it was just, it was really ugly. And that was all on top of having to work through the loss of my parents. And I didn't even allow myself time to grieve the loss of my parents. Um, until this last fall when I took the, my parents' remains back to New York to lay them to rest. And it wasn't until after I got back from that that I finally allowed myself time to grieve and mourn the loss of both my mother and father. So I think it may have been Hat Man, whatever, whoever he is, saw that moment of weakness with all the struggling that I was going through, all the stress that I was under, and maybe was trying to look at that as an opportunity to come and, you know, mess with me in whatever way he was planning on. So that's the only, that's the only kind of logic that I can apply to it. But, uh, but that's, that's where that thought was going before I, I froze. Sorry, folks. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So there we go. Let's, uh, I think we've been at this long enough for everybody. Um, thank you again to all three of you and Seth particularly to you. Thank you again for the wonderful spirit that you bring in your insights and perspective. Your wisdom is just absolutely wonderful. Thank you for taking time out of your, your, uh, your day and your time out of time away from your family to talk about this with us and to share your experiences, especially. And to you may as well, speaking of special spirits, you know, I love you dearly. Thank you so much for who you are and, uh, Massive thanks to Kevin as well for letting us borrow you for three hours now. <laughs> and to all of you, our viewers, thank you for putting up with us for this long and for all of the technical difficulties. Um, and again, folks, if you like what you see or, or what you've heard, please hit the subscribe button somewhere down there below and hit the notification bell. And uh, you'll be notified every time Roger and I have new content for the Soul of the Unexplained. We do have an episode coming up next week where we're going to have a special guest, Mr. Christopher Bartell, who uh, used to be a security ranger, uh, well, security officer at uh, Skinwalker Ranch. And Chris is just an awesome guy. Got to meet him last year at Phenomicon. Think the world of him. And uh, really looking forward to getting some of him his insights on uh, what he experienced during his time during the Bigelow era out there at Skinwalker Ranch. And again, that'll be coming up next week. So, uh, Closing thoughts real quick. We'll go around the room. Uh, Seth, we'll start with you. Closing, closing thoughts. 
Oh, like I said earlier, I, I, uh, I bless the hat man. I love him as much as, you know, Jesus tells me to love my enemies. Uh, I, I, I don't know what happened to me or you. I, it's fascinating. I have so many more questions than when we started this conversation. Uh, yeah, your story is very, you know, we got through that whole book and I don't think there was quite a story like yours. So uh, I hope you keep us, you know, posted as much as you're comfortable with, with what happens with the, you know, for whatever reason, because I, I, I don't think it's just, it happened and whatever, you know, just some weird thing that happens. No, I think, I think you're meant to uh, follow this somewhere. Right on. Thank you. So my, my love and, and best wishes are with, with you. <laughs> right, right back at you, buddy. Right back at you. May, how about you? Closing thoughts from you. Mostly it's, it's really um, trust your instincts and trust your experiences because you will have people tell you that it was just in your head. It, you know, you imagine something or, you know, you know and, and mental illness or, you know, migraines withstanding, there are things that really do create noise that it may have been a manifestation of something like that. But for the most part, if, if you feel this conviction that this happened to you, then, mm -hmm. then run with that. And obviously, don't be afraid to be a little stronger and, and to fight back with, with these things that, you know, you experience, because obviously someone is trying to keep you from sharing your strength. Um, and again, I have theories about the hats. I'll tell you later. Hats are a whole <laughs> cultural thing for me because, you know, I'm usually in one, right. and, but. Um, well, it's, it's but, funny yeah. you should mention mental illness because being a Raiders fan, <laughs> is there any is there any is there any sports franchise that 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 term applies more appropriately and i embrace <laughs> that fully because i am i bleed silver and black so and i'm a musician <laughs> which makes it even worse right so. absolutely hey you know well you know insanity is hereditary i get it from my kids so <laughs> right on roger my friend what you got about yeah, I'm just going to say that, uh, yeah, trust in yourself. And uh, again, these discussions bring us all together. And I feel that this episode, again, you know, it does leave me with more questions than answers, but it also feels like we've taken one step forward in understanding what different uh, experiences people have. And that will lead us to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. So um, if you are having experiences like this, um, you're not alone. Um, we're here among you and uh, we share those same experiences. And so if you ever feel like you need a friend or somebody to reach out to just to listen, definitely reach out to Jim and I. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, just know that no matter what you're going through, you're not alone and uh, everyone uh, it was a super great episode and everyone's here to help. And I really appreciate the, uh, the thoughtfulness of the way this was discussed and the way it's ended. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Raj. And thank you, May. And thank you, Seth, for uh, taking the time to do this with us. It's been an awesome conversation. I I've gotten a lot out of it. Hopefully our viewers have as well. And like Roger says, folks, Please feel free to reach out to us on Facebook. We're very active on Facebook. Just look for us for the soul of the unexplained and soul that's SOL because I am always shit out of luck, right? <laughs> so soul of the unexplained on Facebook. We're also on Twitter or uh, feel free to hit us up in the comments below um, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, to hear your thoughts. And if you have any experiences, certainly we'd love to hear them. And who knows, Raj, hopefully sometime soon we can get Mike Ricksecker himself to come on and join us for this conversation. Um, he said that he'd be willing to when I met him at Phenomicon, but as you know, uh, Roger, you and I, the last six months have been insane. Um, I just barely got back the ability to walk and sit up from my back injury that I had knocked me down for about five months. And uh, of course, you've had a your own roller coaster of events that have happened, and we just simply didn't have the time to reach out to Mike Ricksecker. And we absolutely wanted to get this this uh, podcast done because we've been promising it for so long. So, hopefully, next time we talk about this top, this topic, we will have Mike Ricksecker himself because cool. he's a really cool guy and he's really knowledgeable. 
and uh, it would be awesome to get him on as a, as a guest. So yeah, with all that, folks, back together. That's right. Absolutely. I'll get the whole band back together. Right. And again, folks, check out Seth's music at asamoth.bandcamp.com. That's as a moth, as in the winged insect, asamoth.bandcamp.com. Seth is awesome. He's a great musician and he's just one awesome human being. And it is an honor and a privilege to count him as one of my friends. And Same for May. Love you to death. You are, you're like family, May. And uh, Roger, you are my brother from another mother. So, you know, love, love all three of you very much. Truly. Thank you for who you are. And uh, with that, folks, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you again for watching this marathon session, for listening to me (laughs) constantly. We will see you next time, folks. Thank you again so much. We will see you. See ya.